live stream is up. Will sergeants begin their recordings? Can you see recording still on the way? Ms. Sergeant Leonardo, you may begin the opening. Good afternoon and welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing on the Committee on Public Housing. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff please turn on your video for verification purposes. Please place cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate to minimize disruptions throughout the hearing. If you have, if you have testimony that you wish to submit for the record, you can do so by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. The hearing is coming to order. Good afternoon. And I thank you for coming to today's hearing on NYCHA 2.0. I am council member Alika Ampre Samuel, and I chair the committee on public housing. I am joined this afternoon by my committee members, council member Van Bramer, council member Perkins, council member Reverend Diaz Sr., council member Salamanca, and I would like to welcome council members Dharma Diaz, and council member Kevin Riley to the public housing committee. I look forward to working with you. And I also wanna recognize, I see um, our honorable Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President with us as well. So I just wanted to recognize the Manhattan Borough President. Again, thank you all for being here. Before we begin and before I begin my formal remarks about today's hearing. I just want to talk a little bit about today's, uh, today in Black history. On this day in Black history, which we all know is an important part of American history, the historic Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was founded on the campus of Howard University on January 13, 1913 by 22 collegiate women who stepped forward and used their collective strength to promote academic excellence and to provide assistance to those in need. The beginning of their work was their contribution to the women's suffrage. Today, Deltas can be seen throughout the country standing for social justice and public service. How appropriate that today's hearing falls on Delta Sigma Theta's 108th anniversary of service. As I am a member of this distinguished organization for 25 years, I am delighted to be in this role as chair of the Public Housing Committee as I am committed and dedicated to public service. So going now into my formal remarks, today's oversight hearing is on NYCHA development, NYCHA 2.0 and the PAC-RAD program. I clearly understand that RAD Pact is included in NYCHA 2.0. This is not redundant, but simply to highlight that the bulk of discussion today will be around RAD Pact conversions. After all, that is the majority of the concern coming from my residents. Although residents make up in my district, the 41st Council District, NYCHA residents make up 10% of my constituency. 10% of my constituency, but NYCHA calls, the calls that come into my office make up 70% of my constituent services. And these are legitimate constituent service complaints. And RAD PAC is no different from those complaints. My constituency is experiencing the fullest extent of NYCHA 2.0. We have PAC to preserve, we have bill to preserve and we have transfer to preserve. And they're all contentious discussions in my own district. We have examples of all three strategies, 
We have two build to preserve projects in one development, Van Dyke houses. And on my Howard Houses campus, we have an upcoming transfer to preserve program. And when I look across my entire district, we have pack to preserve that are coming up in Saratoga Village, Reed Houses, Ocean Hill. And let's not forget Saratoga Square was one of the original PAC type programs before the actual program was in the city of New York. So well over two years ago, the NYCHA and the mayor announced the launch of a new development plan, NYCHA 2.0, which was a revamp of its original 2015 plan, Next Gen. A major component of the plan, PAC RAD, involves converting 62, or at the time, 62,000 section nine units to section eight unit based vouchers with the goal of raising much needed capital to repair and renovate NYCHA's distressed properties. It's a good goal. And we all agree that something needs to be done to fix NYCHA's crumbling infrastructure. But this committee is also here to make sure that goal is being met in the way that puts the rights of NYCHA residents first. We've heard mixed feedback about PACT RAD and there are still many questions about what quote unquote privatizing their housing actually means. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that all plans, presentations and discussions have an impact on people's real lives. Since the launch of NYCHA 2.0, our city has been hit hard by coronavirus that has shown little signs of letting up. And while COVID-19 pandemic brought so much of our city to a grinding halt, the business of the city continues. So today, more than two years and two pandemics later, this committee is ready for answers. What's the status of NYCHA 2.0? How are sites selected? What's happening to properties once they're converted? Who's responsible for making repairs? And how do we ensure that repairs are actually being done? And what kind of impact is this plan having on the overall neighborhoods? And how do we guarantee rent will remain deeply affordable? And most importantly, how are the rights of the NYCHA residents being protected? And so I look forward to today's discussion. And I am hoping that today is informative, productive, and most importantly, that we're able to come out with some solutions to real problems that have plagued the NYCHA developments for decades. We're in a new day and time, and we should be looking at real answers. And so with that, I would like to kick things off by hearing from the first residents themselves. But right now, before we proceed to the opening panels of the NYCHA residents, I will briefly turn it over to committee counsel, Audrey's son, to go over some procedural items. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Audrey Sun, counsel to the City Council's Committee on Public Housing. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. When it is your turn, I will call your name and you will be unmuted. We will now proceed with two panels of NYCHA residents. After each panel, there will be a time for questions from Chair Anthony Samuel and from council members. We will then hear testimony from NYCHA. If council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will now hear from the first panel of residents followed by council member questions. In order to hear from everyone, the clock will be set to two minutes. The first panel will consist of Maria Forbes, Crystal Glover, Aixa Torres, and H Hector Vasquez. Uh, we will begin with Maria Forbes. Your time. Before, we begin, before Maria Forbes begin, I also want to let everyone know that we've been joined by Council Member Menchaca, Council Member Gibson, as well as Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. And we've also been joined by Council Member Inez Barron. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. My name is Maria Forbes, TA President for Clay Abbey and Tennis Association. Um, 
Claremont Consolidated is a group of seven tenant association presidents, but currently there are only four operating. And the four of us have met, but we had to fight to meet with NYCHA in person to discuss our concerns regarding the RED process because it's just so much to consume at one time. It's a complicated situation. Some of the questions that I brought up was there was no report card in place to the existing developers that they have now to assure us that the services that needed to be addressed for the residents would be taken into consideration. Um, second, that um, the Red TA president should be allowed to join together to submit their disagreements and concerns for removal of any developer who is not addressing the needs of the residents. But it shouldn't just be that we have to join together. It had to be five tenant associations. If it was a tenant association dissatisfied with the services of the developer, it should be just a null and void situation. My last concern is how could NYCHA proceed forward with moving to address implementing RAD right now with the COVID in existence. NYCHA did not come into any apartments and do major repairs that you're going to have a developer come in, take windows out, remove stoves, kitchens, and then the city could get shut down. Irregardless to whether there's a antidote out or not right now, how could you open tenants' apartments in the middle of this COVID situation and think that we should be acceptable to it? Time expired. Thank you. We will now hear from Crystal Glover, followed by Aisa Torres. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair. I'm Malika Samuel and the rest of the committee. I didn't come to this. I didn't come to this meeting to babble on my frustrations or for two minutes of fame. Um, and I didn't come to talk about rad either. I came to talk about. I'm going to start here. The residents of the New York City Housing Authority are going to have to create a movement to change their image. When I look in the mirror, I see an image of what I look like. I've been in NYCHA apartments that look like something out of a magazine. And some of those same people believe that the grounds around their building doesn't matter to them. But when people look at those grounds and they say, look at those animals and how they live, they see an image that reflects us, the tenants. And the caretakers have been given the order to stop cleaning. The order must have come from the top because anyone that works and doesn't do their job is normally fired. I'm showing throughout this video of uh, this meeting pictures of building 1809 3rd Avenue, 101st Street and 3rd Avenue. What, what self-respecting person paying rent would sit and allow their development where they have to raise their children to just sit there and do nothing. One tenant told me she sent pictures to Gail Brewer. She sent them to the chair, to her manager, and nothing's changed. Let me continue. How does a caretaker punch in at 8.40 a.m. on a Saturday, be on the clock till 7 p.m., and the building is still filthy? Sometimes maybe they're given more than one building. And COVID-19 is the excuse of the day for employees not to work. Um, and giving, resi giving residents hand sanitizers and masks is not going to help when the floors in the buildings are filthy and disgusting. I didn't Something is, this is ridiculous. It starts at management, it starts at the top. And for these people, we're paying rent, whether you work, whether you're retired, whether you get an SSI, SSD, whatever you're doing, you're a United States citizen, you're a human. And back in the day, management would complain and, and terminate tenants and all this kind of thing here. Now you want us, the residents, 
to snitch on one another about the smoke-free policies and how they're not being enforced by NYCHA. And we're supposed to snitch on one another and nothing gets done. So the bottom line is to even be discussing RAD and PAC and all this kind of thing here. What right-minded person would even invest any kind of money in buildings where residents tear down the doors, throw cotex and chucks out of windows? Who's going to actually put money into a PAC or RAD or anything to preserve these buildings when you don't even start with the resident associations having them realize that they have the power? Resident associations have always had the power from way, way, way back. We have the power to defend ourselves and to organize because that's where our power is. And so I can go on and on, but respectfully, I'll stop there. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Aisa Torres, followed by Hector Vasquez. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. I, my name is Aixa Torres and I am the resident association president of Alfred E. Smith Houses. I'm here today to talk about and invite all the, all the members, all the members of, of the committee to attend a town hall meeting that residents to preserve public housing will be having on January 27th at 6 p.m. so that you can hear from residents what our issues are with the blueprint, with the 201, with the RAD, and, and we can continue to do um, work together. I, I am really um, tired um, of there are so many plans that have been put forth, and yet there's really been no, no um, real input from the residents. And this blueprint that is now being moving forward, why I have no idea, in the middle of a pandemic is unconscionable. And so I ask you all to join us. Um, you will get an invite. Um, on January 27th to attend our town hall meeting so that you can hear from the residents in public housing, the leaders of how we feel about a lot of things. And to show that we are clear and that we know what we want and what we don't want. And what we don't want is not to be included. In terms of repairs, we need to be very careful with the repair issue because the reality of it is that even though I have a good manager and a good superintendent, if they don't, if we don't have the funding Perfect. for what really ails us, it, it nothing is ever going to get better. And so we look to supporting the Velasquez, Congresswoman Velasquez's bill so that we can get the money for repairs and have a true oversight on how these repairs are done. I thank you for your time. Everyone have a good afternoon. Thank you. We will now hear from Hector Vasquez followed by questions from the chair and council members. Your time starts now. Hello everybody. Uh, thank you council for having this uh, meeting. My name is Hector Vasquez. Um, I am a uh, resident, longtime resident of uh, Fulton Houses and I've lived in NYCHA. Uh, residences for over 25 years and I've been I'm a, um, a disabled veteran and I've been raising my two children in housing uh, who were born in housing. Um, I'm also I want to bring attention to the PACT RAD program. Uh, I understand it's been around for a long time and it's been a lot of hesitancy, a lot of the residences uh, against it. Um, I'm also against it uh, to an extent uh, the way it is that it's in this present motion. I'm a part of the Chelsea Working Group has been, uh, which is a collaboration of over 50 uh, community leaders, uh, politicians, uh, NYCHA representatives. Um, and uh, I've been privileged to be a part of that for over a year and a half. And we've been working toward making uh, changes toward the PAC RAD program, uh, which basically uh, secures our homes. And it's totally different than the PAC RAD program that exists now. 
And actually, uh, this blueprint for change is actually, there are pieces of it that have been adapted from the, from the new rules and regulations and protections that our work group has gotten together over the past year and a half. Um, I'm happy to say that the, uh, we, after many months of working through, uh, through the COVID and the pandemic and everything that's been happening over the year and a half, uh, the plan uh, should be submitted hopefully by the end of this month. Uh, and um, I'm, hopefully this will be a model for the other uh, pack rat programs that are going to be being put forward throughout the whole city. I wish the, we had completed this before the other ones throughout the city had been uh, started. And maybe the uh, other residents can use this as a model to hopefully adapt uh, to any future changes that may happen, because I think it's a really good program that we put together. It is really unlike that's already been uh, placed forward. And uh, what you're going to hear today, and you're going to hear a lot of naysayers that are against it, and I get it. Uh, there's a lot of fear in the community about it, a lot of uncertainty, but we put so many protections in place um, and that I, I really feel good and confident that this is a good plan moving forward as long as these protections that the work group I've put together are implemented. Okay, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, Audrey, is, that, is Mr. Vasquez the last for that panel? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, Chair Amprey Samuel, did you have any questions for the first panel? Yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, I do. So first, thank you so much for all of your testimonies. I, I, I would like to um, first just state that there's an overarching reoccurring theme um, from what I'm hearing, and everyone is saying the same thing, that um, there should be more input from the residents. And so, um, you know, that's something that we will clearly flesh out during the testimony. But um, Mr. Vasquez, I wanted to just ask you, can you give us a little more information about your involvement with the Chelsea Working Group and what's happening at Fulton Houses? I know there was a conversation about a build to preserve or like an infill um, um, conversation. And then you also mentioned RAD and PAC. So can you just um, give us a little synopsis of what your actual involvement was um, as a resident? Um, as a resident, um, um, I was asked to uh, voluntarily put, put in a lot of time with, with this along with many other residences and other leaders in the community. Uh, basically what was asked of us is to what we needed. We were asked what was our biggest uh, fears and what our biggest problems and issues that were existing every day, like leaks, rats, uh, criminal activity in the neighborhood, uh, poor management, poor uh, ticket handling uh, from A to Z. And not only that, um, you know, I'm also a member of the Tennis Association, LA Chelsea. Uh, where I resided for the, for the, uh, the beginning of uh, all this uh, for the first 20, 20 years. Um, and basically, as, a, as being a resident and a member of the Tennis Association, I, I was, was exposed to a lot of the issues that we've been dealing with day in, day out, uh, like many of these other four folks here on, on, on this um, testimony today that I've been, uh, or you're going to hear a little later. Anyway, um, we were asked to put in these uh, issues that we're having. And we were also asked to look at other ideas that have been implemented through other pack rad programs throughout the US and even internationally. We looked at uh, the way that was, uh, housing was approached in England and also in Russia as well. And we actually had a, a member of the work group who traveled there um, and brought back some reports and showed us video and pictures and give us a thorough report and, uh, on how that went. Um, and basically you what we where? did was we did took, you travel, you, yeah. you traveled where? No, I didn't travel, but we had one of the work group members who actually had some, went out there and brought back a report. And we also had some folks, uh, present on a certain given workshop, uh, some of the ideas that have been implemented throughout, uh, where basically we've had ideas thrown around where residents was, where take, uh, took on the management role. Um, and what were the downfall and the pitfalls of that? And what were some of the successes of that? Um, 
We also looked at other ideas in, uh, that were used in Russia um, that were also similar in scope. Um, and basically we found that it was, uh, they were all well and good, but it took a lot of time and it looked, uh, you needed a large talented pool of people that actually wanted to put in the time. And let's face it, I mean, sad fact is I mean, we don't have as, we have a lot of hardworking people in the community and they sometimes don't have a lot of time to even show up for the tennis association meetings, I'm sad to say, uh, or not, or, or we could use a lot more support. And we try to reach out to everybody that we can um, but unfortunately, people work and they have lives, they have families to raise. So the scope getting uh, residents to self-manage, it's, it's, it's somewhat doable, but it's a long, and unfortunately, we are suffering here. And uh, it would take many years to. Okay, we're having a little bit of difficulty with your sound. Um, Mr. But thank you for yeah. yes. it's, it's going in and out. But thank yes. you so much um, for yeah. for um, you know providing us with that feedback, Miss Forbes. Um, so based on what you what um, Mr. Vasquez was saying, and based on your testimony, can you explain what the difference is with your um, experience? Uh, Miss Samuels. I want to tell you that NYCHA is not very receptive. So we got our contact memo from them sometime late August. I had death in my family. So by September, they were trying to proceed to push the meeting on myself and the other three tenant association presidents. And when I say push, to push to say that they didn't want to have a seat at the table with us. So we had already submitted documents to them, request of documents from them. It was a very, very difficult task in receiving them information, whether it was a 17 document request or not, they should have had it prepared to package because it was nothing that they were doing, but passing it on and on and on to each of the other developments, at least I assume that then when we, I don't even know what convinced Chairman Russ who gave us the whole spiel about having contact with the staff in a stadium, a stadium, when I said to him, it's only four TA presidents and how much staff could you possibly be sending to meet the four TA presidents to discuss or address the complicated package that it is. That that didn't happen, I think, maybe sometime till November, if not on the second meeting partake in December. But then it's still like it's a push situation that they're rushing us through the whole process of going through. They, they contacted the residents to say they were ready to go. It's like, we ready to go right now. And I said, how could you do that? And you're not even finished explaining it to the presidents, the presidents as to what's partaking with this whole process. Even from 2016, when I became enlightened to this, I said, please address us as elementary as you can. They should be assisting tenant associations that they already have in the package that have not been selected yet to educate the presidents, the executive board, and maybe a few residents that could be selected for any said committees to be prepared when it do get here, but not to just say, okay, you've been selected, come on and let's move forward. I just think that NYCHA is not taking their time in educating the residents. I want training for my residents. Once departments are in whatever transition that it needs to go, I think that tenants need to learn the training of new material and things of such that they're going to be receiving so that then when the recertification comes, you don't have that landlord that now you're under Section 8 that's going to mandatory come into your apartment and say, hey, you got poor housekeeping. I don't want to renew your lease because of your poor housekeeping. So NYCH is really, really pushing it to shoving it to pushing it down the tenant associations. And through this pandemic, I really don't think any more steps need to proceed any further. It just should be on hold from if it takes y'all to get the whole rest of the nation and 
inoculated with their vaccination before you have construction workers coming into people's house from wherever, wherever to wherever. So I just feel that we're being pushed to accept something. But I just want to end with this, Alika, is that more so, I want to make sure our protection is in place, that our protection and our rights are in place, and that the developers is going to respect that and night is not going to leave us out in the cold because if two tenant associations are saying they're having the same problem with the same developer and they haven't even done a report card on the developers that they have why should you why should we allow you to shove something down our throat and you don't even have your own the rest of your situation settled to address this overall rack packed or whatever it is that you want to call it. And thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to just highlight, and everyone knows that when we have public housing hearings, um, it's critical for residents to speak first so that we can frame the context of the discussion and be able to just really hear from the residents as to what's happening um, so that um, NYCHA can, during their testimony, address um, those issues and concerns, um, you know, when they're doing their testimony and answering questions. And so I want to um, just thank you for that. Um, and we've also been joined by um, council member Joni, who was actually one of the first uh, members to log in and I didn't see his name. So um, thank you, council member Joni for um, being one of the first members um, at the hearing this afternoon. Audrey. Thank you. Uh, we will now take questions from council members who have any, beginning with uh, council member Barron, followed by council member Machanka, and finally council member Jonai. If any other members have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in turn. In the interest of time, we will keep these questions to two minutes. Council member Barron. Your time starts now. Councilmember Barron, you're muted. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. My questions are not for this panel. My questions are for the administration. So if you could shift my name over to that list, I appreciate it. And to the panelists that did come, thank you for your participation. Thank you so much. Councilmember Mitraka. Your time starts now. Thank you to the chair who has been working tirelessly to, uh, to represent the public housing community and to this committee. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, and as we hit the next budget, we're gonna have to make some big decisions about how we take care of our public housing community. And I hope that we have the courage in this council to put our courage into action and to bring the necessary improvements without having to privatize our um, our, our public housing. And so my question to Ms. Forbes, uh, if you could, um, you mentioned two things that I think are really critical, is the protection of construction that's happening already on site uh, between residents and the workers. Uh, you're, you're, I wanna give you the opportunity to give examples of what we can do to further protect uh, because in Red Hook, we have a massive construction project as well. And it's a resiliency project. It's not a rad project, but it, it's gonna, it feels the same. So I wanna kind of get ideas from you on that. And then the second question is, when we think about rad, do you feel like if we move through a rad project and a rad, rad program for a, for a housing, of, uh, for, for anywhere in public housing in the city, do you, would you still consider it public housing? So, this is to Ms. Forbes. I have to, I have to say no. I had to find. Button. I would have to say no, and I and I'll tell you why. I come from operating from ten years old to maybe sixteen years of age, and I was responsible for taking out the garbage. And we had residents. You understand? My my parents did a lot to ensure that the place was sanitary. I learned to mop the hallway, take out the garbage and shovel the snow at a very early age. Super I'm very sorry for that. That um, um 
we we learned that on a very early basis so that then you know we had to have some tenants evicted i even learned at a very early age what was one shot deal these people came every time every time asking for a one shot deal so now do you think that if people come into this new administration of private management and stuff like that that they're going to understand that there's a difference Oh, you're breaking up. Public housing and Section 8, they don't have to open the door for leaks. They don't have to open the door for a lot of things. So there would be no differentiation between the private management to public housing. Because my interpretation of it is that if now it's taken over by a developer. It is a mandatory requirement that for your recertification, that landlord is allowed into your apartment. And then any other circumstances, if they respond to the repairs, let's get that. If they respond to the repairs that you got a leak from above, that then they're gonna go into that tenant's apartment. Where NYCHA has not enforced that for years, years, years to go into tenant's apartments where leaks and things are coming from. So now they tenants need to be educated to understand this is private management. This ain't public housing. You playing with a whole nother different party of people who may be even looking to move you out so that they probably could sell the apartment at rent apartment at value market rate or what have you. It's just gonna be a very difficult thing in explaining. And that takes some time to educate people. I'm not only asking for training to residents to understand the new property that they have got, they need to understand the new changes that a section eight certificate is different from a, a, a housing authority certificate. Now in construction, I wanna say that, um, huh, that's a very sticky situation. Let's deal with it on the PAC issue first. And, I, and I've seen Red Hook in those areas on the news surrounded by dust and dirt and dirt and dust that like, how could you even begin to address that in this COVID situation? But um, with, them forcing the pack on us and now you got a developer coming in and say i'm on time i got a schedule let's um take out the windows today well then suppose the whole city gets shut down today regardless to whether this immunization is up that mean maybe some tennis windows that still have not been ordered and now the windows on the floor or on the ground and here then you got the radiators disconnected we in a heated season Whatever the situation may be, that's not a good situation to be in, whether it's summer, spring, winter, or fall. I just don't think that right now with the pandemic, should this be forced upon us? Not at this time, not at all. So I, I just wanna say uh, for time's sake, that that's probably one of the most clear uh, renditions of the understanding that we should pause this conversation and get to uh, funding the, the needs now before we move into a massive change, which is why I don't support RAD. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. And I look forward to the conversations that we'll have in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We will now take questions from Council Member Jonai, followed by Council Member Gibson. Your time starts now. Okay, we will move to Councilmember Gibson and return to Councilmember Jonai. Your time starts now. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair and the members of the Public Housing Committee and 
all of the tenants who are on today's call, um, those that are watching, and certainly the members of the administration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very important conversation we're having, and I appreciate this first panel of tenant leaders giving us your opinions, your thoughts, and suggestions on how we move forward. Um, I too, like many of you, have a lot of grave concerns around how we move forward in the middle of a global pandemic. I am very concerned about the outreach and the engagement on the ground. And I wanna thank all of you tenant leaders for really putting your uh, opinions forward. I have a question for this panel and anyone can answer. Um, in the efforts of trying to find a balance and realizing the situation that we are in, I understand Ms. Forbes, you raising the possibility of a delay. And I think that has a lot of validity and we really should consider that uh, because no matter what, we're still dealing with COVID. And certainly in my borough of the Bronx, we have high positivity cases right now. Um, and so I wonder what you offer of suggestions to NYCHA and the team around how we can further engage. Because I remember last year, those meetings that we tried to have in person, there was a lot of resistance and then even the Zooms just didn't work. Um, but I knew that work had to happen and conversations had to happen. So what can you offer to us in the city council as a way to help in this process? How can we be helpful? How can we provide further engagement? What should we as city council members be doing in our districts with our tenant leaders to make sure that all of you are given the most accurate, up-to-date information and how can we try to work together? Uh, whether you support or oppose, I do think we're having important conversations. So I'd like to know how you think we should improve this process. It needs to be addressed with, let's see what the new federal administration is gonna come in with. If we have a lot, we control both the Senate. I'm sorry, am I able to speak or not? So, can you hear me? You can hear me? We can hear you. Okay, so I think that maybe we should put a hold on waiting to see what now that we oh, Washington is supposed to be in our favor, that maybe, maybe with even the trillions of dollars that are still needed to the whole United States, um, that maybe the HUD could sit back at the table. I'm going to show a new HUD chairperson, a new person at HUD will be appointed. Then maybe, maybe we just need to take a step back, take a deep breath, and let's wait to see what the federal government will offer first, because maybe there could be a bailout. We remember we've lost so many dollars through the Republican Party and through the whole decision in which Washington was um a point deploying money to to new york that we weren't able to do anything there's so much staff loss here in public housing due to the loss of funding so maybe some of those things may be addressed if we just hold our seats and just wait a minute take a deep breath revisit all of the ones that are pending right now to see if the funding is going to become available by the next fiscal allocation. If that's a good enough question, answer to your question, I would just say, wait, just wait a little bit. Let's see what's gonna happen. If it doesn't, then, it, then we can revisit this question and say, what do you think we should do differently? Because still city council haven't been able to give NYCHA enough money to address all of the other needs and neither has the state. So we still crawling, we still crawling. So if we crawling, but there's major repairs still to be done now. So continue the major repairs that you need to do. I'm ready to submit my letters to my all of my elected officials, state and city level to say, these are my capital improvements that I need for my development. And please tell me, a question with Brian Hone and right Brian immediately cameras my windows and my elevators to see where we could go because how do you still ask city council and other elected officials for money when you know that red is getting ready to come in and they're still supposed to do those repairs over I got a big I'm gonna end with this Vanessa I have a very big problem right now 
$3.7 million was supposed to be allocated for 13 fire escapes out of 39 fire escapes. You're telling me you don't have the money to repair the other, you're only gonna fix 13. You do not have the money to replace the remaining of the fire escapes. You're gonna only repaint 10 fire escapes and leave the un-16 unaddressed. That sounds ludicrous to me. It gotta be a problem that all of those fire escapes have to be replaced. The building was born in, built in 1926. So you mean to tell me not all of those fire escapes are in danger? We, the tennis, the tennis could fall off the fire today because they're not stable. I don't know if somebody needs to answer that question for me because I think all of the fire escapes need to be replaced and that you need to find the money to replace all of them because when a new developer get here tomorrow and they painted the other 10 and the rest of them, he's going to look at me and say, Miss, you got to be crazy. That fire escape looked new to me. Because the integrity of no nothing, they haven't brought an engineer here yet to still tell me why the remaining 26 fire escapes is not going to be addressed. Why? Thank so you. I, I would want to wait for some more to come in. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's where I'm at. No, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for your work. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Thank you. Yes. Um, hi, this is Hector Vasquez again. Um, I just wanted to add on. Um, basically, I, I'm in agreement with uh, the previous uh, lady that just spoke. I'm sorry, I've, the name slips my man, her, my name, my head right now. But um, we can't take a one size fits all attitude on this. Okay, um, I understand that. Uh, the development, the developers possibly in her project or some of the other projects, there may be a lot of issues there, okay? But unfortunately, there was no real transparency in the beginning. At least maybe there was an attempt to be made. Uh, I don't know what the background story behind all these are, but from what I've read and from, from the persons, folks I spoke to, it wasn't a great situation. And yeah, there wasn't a good reach out to the people in the community to see what they needed and what they wanted, okay? Um, that was the purpose of this work group that I was a part of, and I'm and I'm sorry that this was not implemented throughout all the other projects in the city. And and but the hope is is that similar work groups will be put together for any future uh, projects that are put forward when when it comes to the rad pack conversions. And hopefully, the plan that we put that we put together will hopefully be looked at. And I I challenge everybody here to review these thoroughly uh, see, to see all the work that we've done. Um, because basically a lot of the stuff she had mentioned, uh, such as the, the selection of the developer, um, we fought long and hard and we actually got NYCHA at the table and they agreed to have tenant representation on, uh, you know, in the selection process now. Okay, so we have, a, we get to review the developer, we get to see the background, um, you know, they, they narrow it down to a, a select few. And then from there, we, you know, say we, we vote in and we give our, uh, we go through the selection process and we vote in who the developers are going to be. Not only that, when the developers are in place, uh, we're talking about, I mean, I, I know people are afraid of privatization. This is not privatization in the, in the, in the essence that we're selling the land and, you know, everybody's going to go private and everybody's going to lose their home. We're talking about the management, okay? We all know that NYCHA, unfortunately, over the many years, has not done a great job of managing these properties, Okay. So why not get some, a, you know, a company to come in that we've agreed to and, and they basically have shown us what they can do based on what they've done with the history of the, a lot of projects they've done and try to manage this and do it better. The land will still be owned by NYCHA, okay? It's leased. And yes, there, will, there may be some infill, meaning in our particular instance, there will be some infill in areas that are not being fully utilized, like a, like a parking lot. Okay, or uh, or uh, a dumpster area. Okay, which is what we've looked at. Okay, and there's a trade off here. There's always a trade off here, and that's why it was so important that residences had a clear line of communication with NYCHA and the leaders and and this whole process. And that's a problem. That's been a problem all along. There's not have there hasn't been resident involvement fully in this. And when this work group was formed, that's exactly what happened. 
And I'm not going to say it was a marriage made in heaven in the beginning. We had a lot of issues. We were fighting half the time in the beginning when we started all this. We didn't want to hear about Pac Rad, okay? But when we modified it and we made these changes and made these, put these protections in place, it, it, it made a, a lot more sense, okay? And we had a really large, I mean, we had folks from the Legal Aid Society here, okay? Community Board 4 involved as well, along with a lot of other people, not just NYCHA at the table. So when you get a lot of talented individuals uh, pulled together in the same room like this, something magical is going to happen. And that's exactly what happened here, okay? And it was a long process, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with the results, okay? And we're still working at it. There's still, uh, we're still making changes even now before we even present it at the end of the month, okay? So I, I really challenge everybody to, to maybe follow our lead and say, hey, you know, we need to get these work groups together before we even put Rad Pact into these projects. We don't want to force these onto, onto the tenants here, okay? I don't want to be forcing it into any kind of situation, but with the proper leadership, which is what's happening here, in this case for Elliot Chelsea and Fulton Houses, okay, we basically have been able to get put together something really good, okay? And honestly, uh, unfortunately, there's you have to learn from these experiences and we have to teach the, the tenants what they need to know about all this, okay? I didn't know anything about Rad Pact in the beginning either. I didn't even know what it meant, okay? But after all this process, I've learned so much. And that's, that's a, it's a learning process. And we've had uh, five uh, town hall meetings via Zoom, okay? We've also had a community board for a meeting where we presented our findings and we proposed the plan. And it's all out there for everybody to review uh, on the community board for website. And basically, I, I really, and we're talking about hours and hours of information and Q&A sessions where we opened it up to folks. And you talked about reaching out to the community and, and the neighbors and the, and the tenants that are involved here. We, we have people, NYCHA, go door to door with us and try to do Q&As there if we could in a safe manner. We left flyers, we scheduled Zoom meetings way in advance of all this. We had tabling where basically we were handling out flyers to folks where, you know, say, hey, these are the dates of the Zoom meetings. It's gonna be in Chinese, Spanish, English, Russian. We had translators, okay? So it takes a lot, it takes a village to do all this, okay? It really, it's a, it's, a, it's a great effort that has to be put forth with everybody involved. And it can't be just say all on NYCHA because obviously NYCHA needs help here. And for us to say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna hope for the new, the new uh, legisl you know, uh, government to come in and save the day. Hey, I'm glad that uh, you know, we've got a new president coming in and things are gonna change. But let me, let me remind you folks, this Red Pack plan was implemented way back in the Obama era as well, okay? Uh, and even before that. So this, the money that we're hoping for is pie in the sky kind of stuff. We're wishing for some Superman to come save the day here. And I just don't see it happening and I'm not willing to gamble here. And, and let's be honest here, even if we get a developer in place, it takes time. The RFP process, the request for proposal, for proposal process, which is basically where you select the developers and you vet them and, you know, we get bids back and we see if it's a good fit. And if we like the plans they're going to put forward and the tenants are for it, it takes time. Okay. So let's say hypothetically, okay, we present the plan. Everybody likes it. Mayor signs off on it. So NYCHA signs off on it. We won't see anything till probably till the end of the year just to get a developer in place, possibly, if we're lucky. So we're talking about a two-year process here, okay? Now, God willing, God willing, I'm hoping that this vaccine gets put out and we all get vaccinated and we're over this hump with, the, with this terrible disease, with, uh, with this terrible virus that's been having us, uh, you know, in its grips for the past year. Uh, we'll be over, hopefully, in a year, uh, by the end of this year or next year. So Thank me, you, Mr. Vasquez. I'm, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> I oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to say <laughs> it's, a, it's a long, it's a long process. Okay. No, I, I so, appreciate it. I, you know, I, I, but, I appreciate your input, and that was the yeah. purpose of this because it, a lot of yeah. times we don't have an opportunity to hear from the residents in the public setting. Yeah. You know, there are so many yeah. Zooms that we're we're having and hosting and not everyone is able to jump on. And this is an opportunity to be able to be no, heard and have the public yeah. hear what's happening and for it to be on the record. So I appreciate I appreciate you yeah. and your comments. I, and I, I just wanted to make it clear that it's not it'll take about two to four years to get this done. OK, mm -hmm. so think about that. All right. When we when we decide on all this stuff and say, let's put this all on hold. 
we're just in the planning process right here, you know, for, for at least for our developments. Okay. So this one size fits all attitude saying, Oh, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm against pack rad. Let's put everything on hold is going to affect us here. Okay. And I would love to wait, but I mean, where our homes are crumbling around us and we can't wait any longer. Okay. Thank you. Audrey. Great, thanks very much. We will now take questions from Council Member Riley, and then we will hear from the second panel of NYCHA residents. Council Member your Riley. Time, your time starts now. Uh, thank you, Chair Samuel, and I would like to thank everybody here, the residents. Um, I don't have a question. I actually just have a statement um, from one of the resident association presidents, Robert Hall from Gun Hill Housing um, from uh, my community in District 12. Um, Brother Hall, it, 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 he, he does like the plan, but he what he is stressing to us um, is that the educational um, part of the plan to educate his residents is becoming very challenging, especially that we're during this um, pandemic. Um, he's trying to get a consensus from his residents, um, but in order to do so, he needs to create a plan where he could educate them um, without, you know, being you know six feet away from everybody and, and making sure that he gets their input on if they do support this plan so he just suggests if we could hold this off um or if we could create a a, a thorough educational plan so he could have something to bring back to his residents to educate them on how the pack and rad program will affect them um he does know that we're going from section um i believe section eight to section nine um so he even wants to educate his residents on, on that um aspect of it um, so if we could just come up with that plan, I just wanted to um, express that um, from him, um, being that he could not be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from the second panel of residents, followed by uh, by NYCHA. Uh, the second panel will consist of Doris Huff, Joel Gross, and Sandra Gross. We will begin with Doris Huff. Your time starts now. Okay, Doris Huff appears to be unavailable at present, so we will move to Joel Gross, followed by Sandra Gross. Your time starts now. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joel Gross, the president from Williams Plaza Houses. We are now in the 11th month after our development is already went to the PAC process. We have a new management for the day-to-day -day operation. So when I approach us with the PAC program, it was hard for everybody, for our executive board, for, for all of our residents. Then we come um, to NYCHA, let's come to the table, and we start a good professional communication with NYCHA, with elected officials to work hand by hand and really understand the program. I request from NYCHA, I would like every single resident sh should have the opportunity to read and understand the program. Every meeting and all the documents was translated. We have um, tr interpreters, we have multiple meetings. I will say between 15 and 20 for sure meetings. I was having my own meeting with the residents and every month or twice a month Right now, after 11 months, we're in the process, even the leases, we got a draft for the leases. We have it, I think, in eight languages. So we had out the lease in eight languages for every single resident should have the opportunity to come and pick, and pick a draft in the lease and read it. And then we have a meeting, a question and answer meeting. Every resident was having the opportunity to raise um, any questions. And right now, in 11 months after the pact, what we see in our development, the main issues what all NYCHA developments has is the, the uh, mold and lead and the leaky pipes, the heat and hot water issues. Right now, as our the new developer just came, came in 11 months ago, even with the pandemic, we have new rooftops 
time uh, expired. We have right now, um, they fixed like 90% on the water supply lines. And the waste lines was fixed, was repaired. All shower caps and uh, all plumbing is done. Right now, they are, they are going to the sources for why are we having mold? Because the leaks and also the ventilators in the bathrooms is clocked. It's 60, 70 years old. The exhaust fans is not working. Right now they are doing our ventilation system, brand new fans, exhausts, the cleaning the, um, the exhaust. Right now I was having on a daily basis, multiple complaints for mold. Right now, I, no, no complaints, no complaints. The process, I think we have great communication. Af right now after, even we, last year in December, I have personal meeting with the chairperson we have Brian Hornan, we have Jonathan Govaya, we're still in communication with NYCHA. And we still, and we have very good communication with the new management team. We have weekly meetings with the construction people to address any issues. And we always in communication with elect officials, with NYCHA, with our management. So far, as of now, everything runs pretty well. A lot of repairs was done. Everybody was receiving um, um, new appliances, we have new frigidaires, bigger sizes from NYCHA, 30 inch stove, new windows, the new windows first, what we have with the windows, no, uh, no water is penetrating and also um, the new windows gives us a seal. When uh, most of the NYCHA residents has an issue, when it's windy, you have the winds through the windows, the, wind, the old windows is old like 30 years, was uh, it is uh, already broken, and in the Independence Tower we have a new boiler. The, the Independence Tower is running ten years on temporary boilers. Every year we have co numerous complaints. Most of the winter, no heat and hot water. Right now, with the new management, they came in, and in ten months, we have a brand new state of the art boiler system. We have right now heat and hot water. To our entire family, to our entire development, that will that we we was talking with Nigel for years about the boiler issues. Everybody knows the answer: money. They don't have the money. With the new management in place, we are already accomplishing a milestone with upgrades in our development. Great, thank you very much. We will now hear from Sandra Gross followed by Dervis Huff. The time starts now. Okay, it looks like there's some audio issues. So we will hear first from Doris Huff, followed by Sandra Gross. Thank you. Your time starts now. Hello. Hello. Hello, good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doris Huff. I'm the TA president from Campus Plaza. And I'm, um, I'm calling in because I, I totally agree with Pac. Um, I'm one of the ones that got, um, I got remodeled under Section 8, under the um, Section 8 RAD. I live in Section 8, and we got remodeled under RAD. I feel every resident that lives in housing has the right to live properly without walking over um, stuff over the elevator, feces, whatever. When these own, new owners came in my development, they came in, they remodeled our hallways. They made the hallways look brighter, more warmer, more conservative, more energetic, more everything. They came in our apartments, they rewired our um, electrical, electrical, electrical. They redid our bathrooms, which we as a tenants, we requested bath fitters. So we got pretty much what we requested because we didn't want our bathrooms to be condemned or not be able to use our bathrooms at weeks at a time. 
Um, they came in, they remodeled our kitchens, gave us new windows, gave us new boilers, gave us new roofs. And we all know any housing development that's been so many years of disrepair or non-repair are in desperate need of this. Yes. Do tenants, do, were the tenants afraid and scared in the beginning? Yes, they were. Did they have a reason to be? We all were scared, but I'm telling you, we've been here now for four years under this new, under the new privatization. My rent is exactly the same. 30% of my, my income, NYCHA is still in ownership of 50% of the buildings. So I, I, I just want people to understand it is a good thing. It's not a bad thing at all. And that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Sandra Gross. Your time starts now. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, hi. My name is Sandra Gross. I'm the TA president of Baychester Houses. How are you doing? Um, first of all, I would like to thank NYCHA for turning Baychester over to the um, PAC program because as the last two, um, last two persons spoke, presidents spoke, um, me and my residents, we are very satisfied with um, our new management. Um, we have we were having the same issues with NYCHA, no hot water. Elevators um, weren't being repaired on time. Um, roofing, leaking, mold. Um, we've been, it's been two years since we had our new management, and we had a m much, much big improvement. Um, when they came in, they came in with a lot of issues, you know, with the tenants and NYCHA, whereas you had a lot of tenants owing rent. And, um, you know, it was hard for them to get the records um, from NYCHA so they could get their money. And what they did was they took over the whole bill, whereas the tenants didn't have to pay the back money. We received new appliances, um, new floors. Um, I worked very, very well with the management team. Um, the tenants are very, very happy. We're very satisfied. Um, if you would take a tour in Baychester today, you wouldn't even notice Baychester. We're um, we're modernized. I'm very very happy with the PAC program, and um, me, I would suggest that um, you know if they're offering you PAC program, sit down and talk with your tenants, you know, and get their input like I did. Because in the beginning, you know, I was against the PAC program, you know, but as um, a resident. You know, there's nothing we can do going against NYCHA. But, like, again, I like to say I'm very satisfied and happy, and I'm speaking for my tenants, too. They came in and did a wonderful job. We have new boilers, a new laundry room, new elevators, refrigerator wow. stove, new kitchen, um, new hallways, the lobbies. Um, we have the new bathroom. We have recycling rooms now. Um, we have less less activity with dogs on the grounds. Um, they came and gave us new landscaping. Baychester is very, very happy. Very happy. We're very satisfied. So I would suggest that, you know, you will look into it and go along with the program. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. We will now hear testimony from NYCHA, followed by testimony from the remaining members of the public. A reminder to council members, if you have a question for the administration, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. And we will limit council member questions to five minutes. We will now proceed with testimony from the administration, which is rep being represented by Jonathan Govea, Lisa Bovit Bova Hyatt, Lakeisha Miller, Leroy Williams, Simon Kowitsky, Marissa Schaefer, Lamar Fenton, Matthew Tarney and Brian Honan. I will now administer the oath. 
After I say the oath, please wait for me to call your name and respond one by one. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Jonathan Govea? Yes, I do. Lisa Bova Hyatt? Yes. Lakeisha Miller? Lakeisha Miller? Okay, we will proceed in return. Yes. Will... Sorry. Could we get that one more time for the record? Yes. Thank you. Leroy Williams? Yes. Simon Kowitzki? Yes, I do. Marissa Schaefer? Yes. Lamar Fenton? Yes. Matthew Charney? Yes. And Brian Honan? Yes. Thank you. You may begin when ready. There should be a slide deck up. Is that visible? <clears throat> yes, we will have that up shortly. Great. Chair Alika and Sample Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing, other distinguished members mm -hmm. of the City Council, NYCHA residents, <clears throat> and members of the public, good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Gavaya, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Real Estate Development. I'm pleased to be joined. Sorry. Um, I am pleased to be joined by Lisa Bova Hyatt, Executive Vice President for Legal Affairs and General Counsel, Lakeisha Miller, Executive Vice President for Lease Housing, Leroy Williams, Director for Community Development, and members of the Real Estate Development Team, Simon Kowitzki, Vice President of Portfolio Planning, Marissa Schaefer, uh, Vice President for Transactions, uh, Lamar Fenton, Vice President for Asset Management, Matthew Charney, Vice President for Design and Construction, and Brian Honan, Vice President of Intergovernmental Affairs. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss our efforts to stabilize a critical source of affordable housing in New York City, make investments that support resident health and prosperity, and engage more deeply with our communities and planning for the future. It has been clear for several years that a new direction is needed for public housing in New York City. In an effort to begin comprehensive repairs and put our buildings on a more solid and secure footing, the NYCHA 2.0 program, which is a comprehensive strategy to rehabilitate and preserve over 62,000 units in our portfolio, was launched in 2018. NYCHA 2.0 consists of three key tools, pack to preserve, build to preserve, and transfer to preserve. Since the launch, NYCHA has made significant progress in advancing the NYCHA 2.0 program. As I will describe in greater detail later in the testimony, we are bringing comprehensive repairs to several thousand apartments across the city through the PACT program. We've also closed two transfer to preserve transactions and are working towards a build to preserve project in Manhattan as referenced by Hector earlier today. Despite the progress made today, we know residents and elected officials have questions and concerns about our programs specifically related to resident rights and protections and oversight of our PACT partners. And this was made quite clear during the opening panels and I thank the residents for their participation earlier. Thus, in addition to updating you today on the progress of our repairs, we wanna update you on the very concrete steps we are taking to better engage with residents, meaningfully incorporate their input, maintain and strengthen resident rights and provide strong oversight of our projects and our partners. Next slide, please. The NYCHA 2.0 program is managed by NYCHA's real estate department, supported by a number of other NYCHA departments, including community development, law, and leased housing, which administers the HUD Section 8 subsidy. Since 2019, we've been building a team of real estate professionals, public housing experts, architects, planners, and urban designers to develop a fresh approach to our work. We now have four verticals in the department, portfolio planning, design and construction, transactions, and asset management, each of which is led by the vice presidents on the panel today. The real estate department is fully committed to preservation of NYCHA's deeply affordable housing stock, the protection of resident rights, creation of complete and health, healthy communities, oversight of our development partners, continual improvement of our policies and procedures, and customer service to our residents. The design of our department and the concepts to which we are committed are the driving force behind the critical improvements that we have launched, which I'm happy to share with you today. Next slide, please. First and foremost, 
we want to stress that we put residents first. We recognize that residents need to play a more significant and active role in our projects. It is our residents who are living with the unacceptable conditions in aging buildings with failing systems that have been neglected by a scarcity of federal funding. NYCHA's nice residents are the backbone of New York City, something that has become only more evident during the pandemic as countless NYCHA residents have stepped up like so many other New Yorkers to keep the city running as essential workers delivering essential services, as parents, grandparents, and caretakers attempting to do the impossible of homeschooling and caring for children while working, and most central to what we'll focus on today as residents expecting safe, healthy, and livable homes for their families. Next slide, please. The Real Estate Department's approach is centered on three, three, three key principles. First, improving residents' lives through comprehensive repairs, relevant social services, and the creation of complete communities. Second, maintaining and strengthening resident rights and protections and meaningfully engaging communities in planning for the future of their homes. And third, building partnerships and collaborative working relationships with residents, elected officials, housing rights advocates, nonprofits, general contractors, developers, and property managers. This approach will be brought forward and amplified in all of our work that NYCHA's relevant real estate department will undertake moving forward. Next slide, please. As was mentioned, NYCHA 2.0 was launched with three distinct tools as identified in earlier in the testimony, packed to preserve, built to preserve, and transfer to preserve. I will now provide an update on each of the programs. Next slide, please. So packed to preserve. Through the permanent affor affordability commitment together initiative, we will address nearly $13 billion in desperately needed and long overdue repairs in 62,000 apartments, a third of our portfolio and home to about 140,000 New Yorkers by the year 2028. PACT is New York City's implementation of the Federal Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, or RAD. To date, we have converted eight PACT projects totaling nearly $1.8 billion in capital improvements. More than 9,500 apartments are in construction or rehabilitated, and another 12, nearly 12,000 are part of projects that are in the process of resident engagement or pre-development, and there's more to come. Next slide, please. We heard earlier about concerns around ownership and oversight. I want to emphasize the fact that this is not privatization and this is not a path towards privatization. NYCHA continues to own the land and the buildings converted through PACT and all apartments continue to be subsidized through HUD. Accordingly, NYCHA and HUD both have a regulatory and oversight role. For example, affordability is a requirement of the PACT program that runs with the land and cannot be done without NYCHA and HUD approval. I will go into a bit more detail on this point and explain how PACT developments remain under public control and oversight. NYCHA remains involved in the developments after PACT conversions through a few different and significant roles. First, as I mentioned earlier, NYCHA is the Section 8 administrator for the entirety of the PACT program. This means that NYCHA administers a Section 8 waitlist. Private developers cannot lease up a new apartment outside of the NYCHA administ administered Section 8 waitlist. In this role, NYCHA also controls the release of the HUD Section 8 subsidy. This means that PAC developers do not receive a rental subsidy from the government without NYCHA oversight and without meeting federal standards in each apartment for which they seek subsidy. Second, NYCHA monitors the conditions at the development and ensures that developers adhere to their obligations to residents. The PAC projects are monitored through numerous reporting and tracking efforts, including monitoring the construction scope and progress of repairs, creating new strategies to prevent displacement, monitoring ongoing maintenance and repairs at the properties, job placement and training related to section, the Section 3 program, MWBE contracting, and monitoring the financial health and financial performance of each transaction. Strengthening these efforts is integral to our design and construction and asset management strategies as we build out those teams, processes, and supporting technology to support those efforts. Finally, we're also supported by the asset management infrastructure of our PACT financing partner, the sister agency, the New York City Housing Development Corporation, or HDC. Next slide, please. So let's recap some resident rights. PAC preserve re resident rights uh, in the following ways. Rent remains capped at 30% of household income. Residents continue to have succession rights. Residents and tenant associations continue to have the right to organize and receive funding. And residents will not be rescreened before signing a new Section 8 lease, which means that so long as a, a household is in good standing, it can transition to Section 8 regardless of income or family composition. These rights are codified in the HUD-RAD program requirements and also through the PACT Section 8 lease, which has been strengthened based on feedback from resident leaders and housing advocates, such as the work that we had done with the Fulton Working Group, as Hector alluded to earlier. NYCHA requires that PACT developers all use the same PACT Section 8 lease and do not have discretion to revise it without NYCHA's approval. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the scope of rehabilitations. 
it is a HUD requirement of the PAC program that the developments are fully and comprehensively renovated. We work closely with our development partners and residents to craft comprehensive rehabilitation plans that address building systems such as elevators, boilers, roofs, windows, and facades, grounds, including landscaping, lighting, security, playgrounds, and public spaces, common areas, including lobbies, hallways, stairwells, community spaces, and of course, the resident apartments where kitchens, bathrooms, and flooring are all typically replaced among other improvements. Next slide, please. With each of our projects, we are continually raising the bar and demanding more from our partners. For example, we're also prioritizing project plans that foster sustainability and better connect our communities to their surrounding neighborhoods through good urban design. We're committed to not only repairing these developments, but improving them by the delivery of, by, for example, the improving, improvement of the delivery of heat and hot water by repairing and replacing antiquated systems and distribution lines behind the walls, reducing outages while simultaneously reducing our energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. And implementing security plans that provide new cameras, doors with remote access that work, intercom systems, better lighting, and other enhanced security measures, and also improving accessibility and accommodations for our senior and aging residents. I want to emphasize emphasize that because PACT results in a comprehensive renovation, it is the primary tool that allows NYCHA to address the underlying causes of issues that have plagued NYCHA residents for decades, such as leaks, mold, lead, and pests, which will improve the health and safety of our residents. In addition to physical upgrades, PACT brings other resources into the community. For example, we require that PACT developers partner with community-based nonprofits to deliver social services and community programming based on the needs of the specific community. Service providers are required to staff dedicated on-site social workers. Second, NYCHA is asking PAC partners to implement programs such as affordable broadband internet and credit building initiatives. NYCHA also requires the PAC developer to create employment opportunities for NYCHA residents through the PAC construction scope and ongoing property management. We are proud of the work we have been able to accomplish for residents and in advance of this hearing, we have provided some photos of the upgrades we've completed so far. Next slide, please. So let's talk about engagement. Um, residents have been, residents must be meaningfully engaged in planning for the future of their homes and communities. To ensure our PACT investments achieve community goals and priorities, we have built a new team of planners to learn directly from residents and their lived experiences and conditions at their development, educate them about the PACT program and work directly with residents in shaping our final plans. I'll summarize a number of important changes we are making to our engagement approach. First, we have created a new planning process that is transparent and starts much earlier in the past. At the beginning of each process, we will lay out full project timelines and all of the key milestones. We want every meeting, workshop, and engagement activity to have a clear purpose and agenda. In this way, we are striving to make the best use of valuable but limited time that residents have to take out of their busy lives to engage with us. Second, we are making resources available to support residents during the planning stages. Specifically, we recently announced the creation of an exciting new initiative called the Resident Planning Fund to provide residents with free technical assistance by trusted third parties. As part of the new program, residents will be allocated a pool of funding that they can use at their discretion. For example, residents could hire a local community-based organization to serve as an independent advisor or attend an advocate to me mediate or resolve tenancy issues, a financial or legal consultant to vet NYCHA plans, or an urban design consultant to help craft a community vision for public spaces, just to name a few ideas. We released the RFP in December to select a consultant team to help us build out and implement this new program and look forward to getting it up and running later this year. We're also providing free legal services in connection with PAC lease signing so that residents can get independent professional advice regarding their new PAC lease and ensure a seamless transition into the Section 8 program. Most recently at the PAC Manhattan Bundle, the Legal Aid Society participated in information sessions and set up a free hotline that residents could call for assistance. We plan to continue making free legal services available at all PAC developments going forward. And third, we are giving residents a greater voice in the planning process. Going forward, we will be inviting residents, resident leaders to participate in selecting the developers, general contractors, property managers, and social service providers who will be renovating and maintaining their development. Resident leaders will have the opportunity to review proposals, interview development teams, and provide feedback before final selections are made. This is a step we've never taken on now and are excited to bring residents closer into this critical element of the program. Lastly, we recognize that uh, information sharing and clear communications are key factors to success. Next slide, please. We have created new print materials, videos, web resources to ensure that residents have the latest information about PACT and their development 
and that they understand the rights and protections, the rehabilitation process, and other program elements. We are now hosting monthly packed information sessions, so any resident or member of the community can learn more and get their questions answered at times that are convenient for them. Since mid-November, we have already hosted four packed information sessions with attendance ranging from approximately 80 to 420 participants. Next slide, please. We heard earlier about concerns about engagement during the pandemic, so let's address that issue. Earlier last year, the COVID pandemic effectively ended our ability to continue hosting in-person meetings and forced us to rethink and expand upon the ways we connect with residents. Currently, all resident meetings are taking place over Zoom and phone conference. To address the digital divide, in advance of a resident meeting, we mail hard copies of our presentation material to every household in the development. We follow that up with pre-recorded and personal phone calls to every phone number we have on record. Staff running the phone lines make sure that residents have received the meeting information and answered any specific questions residents may have about the PAC program. During the Zoom meeting itself, which residents can also join by phone conference, we run conference lines in multiple languages and residents who write down their questions can have them answered immediately by a staff member monitoring the chat instead of waiting for a live Q&A and at the end of the presentation. Anyone who doesn't get their question answered can reach us via a dedicated email address or telephone hotline. Messages received and returned later that messages are received and returned later that day. Any recordings of the sessions are immediately posted online. I tell you all of this to say that while adapting to this new reality has not been easy, I believe that we are actually connecting with more people and with greater efficiency and ease than we ever have before. Next slide, please. Now I'll quickly update you on Build to Preserve and Transfer to Preserve. With the Build to Preserve program, NYCHA can generate funding for NYCHA developments while creating housing and other neighborhood amenities where they are desperately needed. This is done by creating new buildings on underused land with the proceeds first going to repair buildings in the surrounding development. All new residential buildings will be subject to the city's mandatory inclusionary housing levels of affordability for contributing new and permanently affordable housing for New Yorkers. NYCHA is exploring a Build to Preserve program at Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood with working group residents, elected officials, community representatives, and housing organizations, as you heard from Hector earlier today. Except for a pause in the spring of summer 2020 due to COVID, this working group has been meeting since the fall of 2019 to produce community-driven recommendations to address the future of Chelsea, Chelsea Edition, Elliott, and Fulton Houses. The working group aims to publish a list of recommendations soon, which would then inform the subsequent RFP issued by NYCHA to select development partners. Build to preserve at these developments will be combined with PAC to leverage each of these transactions to bring comprehensive repairs. With respect to transfer to preserve, in 2020, NYCHA successfully completed our first two standalone transfers of excess development rights, known as air rights. One at Ingersoll Houses in Brooklyn and another at Hobbs Court in Manhattan, generating approximately $27 million in proceeds for capital repairs at the neighboring NYCHA properties. Early last year, NYCHA released a request for expressions of interest for further air rights transfers with the hopes of generating additional revenue for capital repairs at NYCHA developments. The RFEI established criteria for how NYCHA will evaluate proposals in consultation with residents. While the amount of revenue each proposal generates is of significant importance, we also consider how the proposed development directly benefits NYCHA residents, developers experience completing similar projects, and how well the proposed development integrates into the surrounding neighborhood. We are currently in the process of evaluating several air rights proposals and we'll be reaching out to NYCHA residents uh, soon about these opportunities. Next slide, please. With all of these initiatives and the hard work applied to them, we are transforming and preserving our buildings so they can better serve residents today and for generations to come. We are proud of our mission and, uh, and improving the residents' quality of life while protecting their rights. But we will only succeed if we come together in service to our shared goal of strengthening NYCHA and ensuring that it remains a vital source of affordable housing for New Yorkers. Thank you for your support. We are happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We will now begin with questions from Chair Ambry Samuel, followed by questions from any council members who raise their hands on Zoom. Okay, thank you so much. Jumping right into it. Um, because we were just looking at the slide presentation, I just wanna point out that slide number two okay. stated program management. Correct. And that was page two, right? And is there a way that we can put that back up? Uh, 
Uh, yes, one moment. Thank you. Okay, so program management. This is slide number two. This is the first slide that you started talking about, right? This is your the start of your presentation. Correct. And it says our team of real estate professionals, housing experts, architects, and urban planners help us fulfill our commitments. And then you go through this list of commitments, right? Mm -hmm. What's missing from this first slide? Um, well, I mean, this slide is meant to talk about our uh, the real estate group um, and the things that we yeah, are committing so, to. So, I, so, so this is a problem for me from the beginning, and this is what I want to point out. Okay. Because right after, Audrey, can you go to the next slide? Putting residents first. You cannot put residents first if you don't talk about them first, and they are not seen as experts and what's happening in their housing development. So from the jump, from the start, and I'm gonna tell you right now, that wasn't even going there. I'm gonna tell you right now because I have a whole lot of colleagues with a whole lot of comments <laughs> related to deals in their districts. But I wanna point out that you started off wrong. And the reason why I point that out is because this is what we talk about time and time and time again. The theme that I even mentioned when the residents were speaking, when they were testifying, was the fact that they have not been part of the initial, not just a conversation, but a partner in all of this and seen as experts within their developments. So I just wanted to point out as we go through the questions right now, that from the beginning, the first slide, program management slide, did not at all mention residents, but you said, we're going to put residents first in the next slide. And I just want to emphasize that putting residents first is not just saying it, but actually doing it. And this first slide is problematic. So I just wanted to, to, to highlight that. Um, and just that took me to a different place. Um, and I also would like for you to just clear up the comments that Mr. Vasquez stated because Mr. Vasquez kept referencing RAD within his development and he kept talking about what was happening at Fulton Houses in Chelsea. So can you just explain what is actually happening? Is that RAD? Because I just saw on the slide, it was under the bill to preserve. And so I just wanted to kind of figure out what is actually happening um, just for context. So at, at the uh, Chelsea developments, we are looking at a combination of built reserve and packed. Uh, so Hector was correct, it, it is a mix. The project started primarily as a built reserve project, but as I noted, it will also combine uh, an element of packed as well at Chelsea. Okay, and so that's going to be uh, you know, clearly a, a, a topic of discussion like later on in the questioning you know, just related to how each development and looking at their capital repair needs are being repaired based on what is happening, what development projects are taking place and to see if that particular development project or that deal will actually renovate all of the units um, in a way to address all of the capital repair needs. So I just wanted to make that distinction because um, some developments are just, you know, a conversation about RAD. Some are just a conversation about build to preserve the infill. And so I wanted people to know and for the public and audience to know that that's a different type of situation because it's a combination of both. So I wanted to make sure that people understood that. Um, that's correct. Okay, so now, as we look at what you presented with the NYCHA 2.0, can you give us uh, just a quick vision statements as to whether this is realistic given the current economic conditions that we are facing now. Because everything that you presented was something that we've heard before. And now that we have been rocked by a pandemic and everything that we're seeing playing out across the country, is NYCHA 2.0 that was laid out something that's actually realistic in accomplishing yes, uh, your 
Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, the program, you know, is still funded by HUD. We are still getting uh, the, the subsidy. It's instead of Section 9, it's through Section 8, and that subsidy continues to flow. Um, and so, you know, the, the way the program is structured, it allows us and the development teams to, uh, you know, to construct some financing around, around that flow of income. And then we can use those proceeds that are generated up front to actually make the repairs. Um, and so it is, we have, you know, we're still moving forward. We just closed a deal, uh, the Manhattan bundle over 1700 units uh, in late November. And uh, despite what's going on with the pandemic or the economy, we've been able to continue to move forward with these transactions. Okay, I know that my colleagues have some questions about that, so I'll leave the follow-up um, for them. Um, the Pact to Preserve aims to address the $12.8 billion in overdue repairs at the 62,000 apartments, and I'm just referencing Twin Park West, Ventances, High Bridge, Franklin, um, Hope Gardens, Brooklyn Pact, and the four remaining LLC, two developments um, were, selected for the, were selected for the Pact to Preserve program. How did NYCHA conclude that these buildings were a good fit for the Pact to Preserve program? So over the years, the, um, the methodology has evolved a bit um, in the very early, I mean, the, the, the threshold issue has always been about addressing physical needs, urgent physical needs. So that's issue number one. Um, in the earlier days of the program with Ocean Bay and some of these early ones, we were looking at um, addressing the issue of bringing renovations to some of the scattered sites. We were also looking at bringing renovations to uh, the unfunded sites. Um, and we are largely through a lot of that process now. Um, we have just a couple of the unfunded just about to be finished and through that whole process. Um, in 2019, we actually launched a new um, methodology. We went through this whole process where we started to look uh, more comprehensively at some other metrics, not just the ones that I had mentioned before. And you know, it, just by way of example, we started to look more at NYCHA operations, which sites are we, um, you know, do we struggle to maintain compared to others, um, and which would be a good fit, uh, you know, for par perhaps partnering with a, a partner to actually do that property management on an ongoing basis. So we've revised the methodology, um, and that is the methodology that we're going to use going forward. Oh man, dang, Jonathan, <laughs> um, I didn't hear anything about speaking to the residents and well know, yes absolutely yeah. absolutely i mean that was the the technical piece of it but as i mentioned in my testimony a central piece of this is the engagement um, and i went into some detail about the engagement uh throughout the testimony i mean we are we have an enhanced community engagement process now um you know we've always done a i think fairly good work around uh, the boots on the ground, the canvassing, the door knocking, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but now we are front loading uh, a lot of work around uh, the education piece, which I spent some time speaking about in the testimony. And we're really trying to front load these, uh, these conversations. The education piece of educating the residents as to what is happening, what's going to happen. No, yes, exactly. We want to talk to folks about what is going on in their development, what are the conditions, what are the challenges, and explain what some of the solutions are. Um, you know, I, I'll turn it over to Leroy in a minute and Simon, who can talk to some of the details of what we've been doing in more recent uh, projects that we've initiated. Um, but the goal is to really, as I mentioned in my testimony, uh, to really spend a lot more time upfront educating folks so that they understand, so they can ask questions, so we can address the issues. Um, and make sure that people feel comfortable and are clear about what's going on. I mean, you've heard earlier. I'm right um, there. What's, what's helpful, I think what's helpful right now is for you to start talking about the plans around, um, and, I, and I think you mentioned um, funding residents to hire legal experts to step in and work with them on, you know, different, just different issues in the, within their developments to, in using your terminology, but I hate when, when folks say like educate residents as if they don't know. Um, I, this is an opportunity to, to kind of flesh that out. And the reason why yeah. I'm mentioning that is because, you know, again, the, the complaints are related to educating residents after the fact. This is what's happening. This is what we have decided. 
you know, this is this is what the the experts in slide two have decided. <laughs> and now, you know, in slide three, we're going to put you first by educating you on what we've decided and what's moving forward. And so, you know, this is an opportunity to to talk about that piece of it. Absolutely. Um... So I would invite Leroy and Simon to provide some insight into what we're doing now around those issues. Um, Simon, are you gonna go first or do you want me? You can start Simon and then I'll come in. Sure, sure. Good afternoon, council members. Um, thanks, Jonathan and Leroy. So, uh, you know, when we started up this team uh, within the real estate department, um, really focused on how we can improve engagement with residents, not only to, uh, again, yes, educate them and make sure that we're sharing the right information, but also really partner with them to make sure that we understand what their goals and priorities are for their communities. And we um, are working and partnering across our agency with so many people, including Leroy um, and others who have really those strong relationships with residents. Whenever we start a project or have identified a project that we feel could be a good fit for the PACT program. We always talk to the resident leaders first. That's the number one thing. Um, and we've started doing that now, you know, during the pandemic, creating that additional space and time before we get into the work of starting large resident meetings and workshops. Uh, we really want to sit down and we do multiple briefings with the TA leaders and with electives to make sure that, you know, we can address any questions uh, that they may have urgent concerns, their priorities. Um, that's always the number one thing that we do before we move into you know, a larger series of resident meetings specifically focused on their development. Uh, another thing that we've been doing just on the education piece generally is establishing more regular and routine information sessions so that we run throughout the year now where people can learn about you know, how the PAC program works generally, their rights and responsibilities, um, what the design and construction program uh, uh, process looks like and all the other things that are really important to folks. Um, one, another, just uh, council member, just to address some of the questions that you had around how residents are involved in decision-making as well. Um, you know, we're starting to change the approach that we take in terms of selecting development teams. Uh, in the past, we have never really allowed for residents to participate in that process of selecting the partners that we work with, oh, the I contractors, the contractors, the property managers, the social service providers. Mm -hmm. And we want to open that up because we really feel that in order to you know, build that trust and make sure that we're setting ourselves up for success here, that residents have an opportunity to interview and meet and provide feedback on you know, mm -hmm. who those people are going to be that take care of their development over the long term. Another thing that you mentioned that we're trying to do and really improve is providing uh, free technical assistance to our residents. So you know, so many residents that I've worked with so far in my time here really know their stuff. Many of them have been on the panels today so far, um, but many others have expressed that, you know, they need a little help and support in understanding uh, complex issues related to real estate development. Um, maybe we all have very busy lives and could use that additional assistance in making sure that, you know, I'm really tailoring my feedback and my participation in ways that are meaningful. So we recently launched a new program uh, called the Resident Planning Fund and hope to have uh, uh, have it more built out by the end of this year, but we'll dedicate free assistance to all the developments we're involved in with PACT. And residents can pick, can choose how they wanna spend the money, whether it's for legal services, hiring urban designers or financial consultants, attorneys, uh, anything, uh, helping to do their own planning process or advising them, providing that objective advice. So that's another really key thing that we're excited to be launching as well. Um, maybe I'll stop there uh, and, and let Leroy jump in and talk a little bit about, you know, not just those different programs and the processes that we're setting up, but also those direct conversations that we have. Um, there's so much that goes into this work, especially now during the pandemic and making sure that we're reaching well, as many I mean, people as possible. Go, I mean, because I have some other questions before we get to like that community engagement piece of it. What I was trying to pull out was, you know, again, mm -hmm. Um, seeing residents as experts and looking at the front end of it. And when I spoke, when I asked the question, um, how did NYCHA conclude that these buildings were a good fit for the Pact to Preserve program? You know, some residents actually want to see their development converted. And 
you know, I, I know of a particular development where the majority of the residents want to see RAD take place because they can't stand NYCHA. And they want nothing to do with NYCHA ever again. And they rather roll a dice with a, a different management company, right? But that particular development was never on the list. And so, you know, again, the, I'm, I'm constantly asking this question, you know, how are you, you know, reaching out to residents and asking them, what would you like to see? You know, what, what are your ideas on what you would like to see in order to have change in your particular development? You know, and what I'm continuing to hear is when we have decided that there should be a RAD PAC program, then we reach out to residents and then explain to them or, you know, once, and, not, and correct me if I'm wrong, did, I'm not sure if I just heard you say, um, there, this particular, you know, pot of funding that can possibly be put in place by next year, by the end of the year, um, are for residents that may be going through the RAD program, as opposed to all developments in order for them to take a look at what's happening with their housing stock and then figure out what's the best program and best fit, and then look at your portfolio from there. You know what I'm saying? And so I think sometimes um, government, the bureaucracy of everything, folks tend to do things as backwards and create problems that may not necessarily exist if you just go to the people first and get their, their input and their expertise first. So I just wanted, so that was the reasoning for that, that question. Um, because. Chair, can I just say on something a little bit about that? Okay. So we do marry developments that have asked for the program and I'm sure there are developments that have asked for the program, like you said. Um, recently, um, we've um, put Metro North as part of the PAC program and they've been asking for the particular program. Um, we also marry that with, of course, the needed developments, right? The, the ones with the highest needs. So I get when you say that, you know, we want to, um, we should go to developments where residents want um, this particular program, but I think it should be a combination, right? With residents wants, of course, because they're the experts, as you say, and I have been working many, many years with residents and they know what they want. They know their developments better than anyone, but then we also have to look at the need like an unfunded development, right? So we know we have uh, city and state developments that were federalized and there were eight developments that had no core funding. So that's a need we have to put in place so that they can have ongoing funding and upgrades for their developments. So we hear you. Um, we are working to make sure that developments that do want to go through the process um, is engaged early and make sure that they are part of the process. So if it's any development that any city council person um, that knows that residents want to be involved in, please make sure to share that information with us because we definitely want to engage them now. Okay, just a quick question. Has there ever been a, a, a system-wide, portfolio-wide questionnaire or survey to every single resident to ask them the question about their development? Do you want RAD packed or build to transfer or, I mean, build to preserve or Transfer to preserve? Has there been like a overall question asked? I, I defer to Lee Rhyme. I don't know if that type of survey has been done. So that survey has never been done. Um, I would say that, you know, definitely it's something that we can look at as a, a suggestion from you. Um, I think that, again, we looked at developments with the highest needs. Um, we looked at developments where they actually asked for the particular program and they've written letters to us um, stating that they wanted like a Fred Samuels houses, um, Metro North houses that I particularly know of. Um, and we try to marry the two. Um, we want to make sure that, again, uh, my whole life in NYCHA for 20 plus years have been working with residents and I know the strength of residents. And you know, if they think that that's something that they want to um, be a part of, I always want to um, make sure that they are heard, and that's what we're putting in part of the program. But we've never, you know, put together a survey, as you say, and ask every single resident, "Would you want to be a part of, you know, PACT or you know, um, you know, air rights deals?" 
Uh, we've never done that. So we can definitely take that under advisement. Okay. 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 All right. Um, I'm going to stop there because it is three o'clock and I know that um, my colleagues have questions and I'm gonna come back to my questions. So Audrey, I'm just gonna stop my questions now so that my colleagues can ask. Okay, sure, thank you. Um, we'll proceed to questions from council members uh, beginning with council member Barron followed by council member Ayala. You will have five minutes each. Council member Barron. Your time starts now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this urgent, critical hearing. And thank you to the panel for coming so that you can field our questions and consider them and make the appropriate adjustments. So yes, we understand that the federal government and the state government stopped putting money into NYCHA and that there are unfunded developments uh, Several of them are in my district in East New York. And now we also understand, however, that people are ecstatic over the new administration. What demands are you going to make of the new administration for additional funds to address these problems? Um, <clears throat> well, we are definitely in search of all capital dollars and would certainly support- Have you much made a request of the incoming administration for a specific amount of money? Well, I'll turn it over to Brian Honan, who is leading up that particular effort. But yes, the, the, what I was going to say is- fast Because I only have five minutes. Have you made a demand and what is that demand? Okay, I will turn it over to Brian, who can Thank give you. the specifics on where we are with that effort. Okay, Brian seems to be having problems. My time is clicking, so let me move on. Um, um, Council we know that I think, I think I'm, I'm good now. Um, we, have, uh, we have met with the members of the transition team about increasing funding both to the capital, uh, to the public housing side and to the section eight side, uh, but uh, not a specific dollar amount. Honestly- okay, I would suggest that you look at your budget and do that, okay? Mm -hmm. Secondly, you talk about, uh, residents' rights, and I'm being uh, abrupt because my time is limited. You talk about residents' rights. When you came to, uh, to do a Zoom conference last week, the first thing you said was, we're concerned about residents' rights. And the very next screen talked about, your questions will come at the end of the presentation. So that seemed to be a disconnect there. We know that one of the reasons that we are in the conditions that they are, NYCHA buildings are in the condition that they're in is because of mismanagement. So yep, you wanna have oversight uh, of these developers that are coming in, but you don't have a record that shows that you know how to manage. So part of the problem is mismanagement. Another part of the problem is outright lies to not only the residents, but to the federal government. And a part of the problem is deception and a part of the problem is fraud. So those are major issues that have contributed to NYCHA being in the situation that it's in. We know that we hear that the major problems are water, uh, leaks, mold, lead, and pests. And that these uh, partners that are supposedly coming in with you are going to address those issues. So this is the latest iteration of movement towards privatization. This is the latest inter iteration of movement towards privatization. So you talk about residents and you want them engaged. That's a wonderful word, engaged. What power, what power to make the decisions about their lives are you giving to the residents? Suppose there's a consensus of residents that they don't want this project. What is their power to not be forced into this project? Well, right now the PACT program is the primary tool that we have to bring the much needed repairs right. and the and comprehensive repairs. If they don't want it, what is their power to not accept the project? I really can't get the long answers because my time is almost gone. What is their power to say, well, we've heard it. 
and we don't want to have to downsize. We don't want to be restricted from uh, having people come after we've signed our lease and have them to have about whatever their reasons are. What is their power? Not engagement, not listening tours and oh, this is great. What is their power to assert themselves to determine that they don't want it and the project not go forward? What is their power to make that decision on their own behalf? Well, we that haven't had that. We have not had that situation as yet. Um, we, as you've heard from some of the panelists who've gone through the process, they're very happy with the results. And so I have to move because I only have 10 seconds. I've heard all of their presentations and I thank the residents for sharing that. Is there a requirement that boilers be replaced by the development team that's coming in? Because that's a major problem, heating problems, uh, major problems. Is there a requirement that they replace the boilers? which are 40, 50, 60, 70 years old? There is a, at least a year long process where we're going in and doing a full inspection of all of the elements, the components, the systems of each of these buildings. And if the, the equipment, whatever it is, boilers or otherwise need to be replaced, they absolutely will be replaced. And then what does NYCHA say is their responsibility uh, to uh, because there's a case, a recent case, where NYCHA saying, "Listen, we're no longer responsible because uh, of the uh, RAD Pact agreement. The new developer has to take all of that." There's a case. Can you talk briefly to that? My time has expired, but I'm asking the chair for an indulgence. Well, I don't know the specific case that you're referring to, um, okay. but the point is, where what I would say is, if residents are unhappy with the type of service or response they're getting from the PAC partners, they can certainly reach out to NYCHA. We want to ensure that the developers are doing what they need to do to make the repairs and provide service to each of the residents and each household. Okay, just in terms of um, infill projects, which you're calling build to preserve, and in terms of air transfer rights, uh, air, air rights that are being transferred, can we in fact, through this, prod, through this um, initiative to support the PAC, program, see that there might be a, a tower of whatever height built on NYCHA property. Does the build, I seem to have confused you, does the build uh, to preserve program allow for construction of new apartment buildings on NYCHA property? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, and is yeah. there a requirement that those new apartments uh, be capped at 60, 50 percent of the AMI, or is it eligible to have uh, market rate apartments included? As I mentioned in the testimony, it would be compliant with the city's mandatory inclusionary housing program. So well, there would be a market rate because market rate can come in with that MIH. So let's be clear, right. not, you know, be devious. It can include market rate. So people need to understand that. And one Absolutely. last thing, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one last thing, as uh, an apartment in the program becomes vacant, what are the eligibility requirements for people coming into a, an apartment that has been vacated? Either because the person left of their own or they had to downsize as is the re requirement with that. Who's eligible to apply for that apartment? Uh, the developers are required to go off of our wait list. Um, Lakeisha, I don't know if you would like to chime in with a little bit more detail, but basically that is the structure. It's it's restricted to your wait list? I yes, it is. Yes. yes. All right. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to say that as I've looked at this program and come to understand it more, uh, Residents have not been involved at the outset. Elected officials certainly have not been involved. I'm finding out about these meetings through a resident calling me and saying, Councilwoman, you know, they've targeted our development. We don't know anything about it. And I'm talking about Penn Workmen so that you can look into what I'm saying. We get an email the day before a meeting as an elected official, I get an email, oh, we're gonna have a meeting tomorrow via Zoom about Penn Workman coming into the project and about Belmont Sutter coming in. Well, whoever targeted them or selected them prior to this day before the meeting announcement. 
So there's much to be said about the for shortcomings of the RAD pack. I think it's paternalistic. I think it's presumptive. And I think it does not acknowledge that the residents should have the authority to decide what conditions they're going to live in and who's going to manage it. We can have residents trained to do what it is that we want to say developers are doing. Because certainly, as one person said, we don't have a report card on these developers. And some of them, it appears, are trying to undermine the leadership that is questioning the movement forward of RAD. And I will talk to you further about that, uh, that apparent undermining of the leadership. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for extending me the extra time. Before you um, conclude, Councilmember Barron, yes. I do. Um, I would like a follow up um, now um, to three of her of three of okay. Councilmember Barron's questions, and that's because it will uh, because what's happening here is happening everywhere, and so it would help us um, in the context of this discussion, this hearing. So um, starting backwards. Um, can you explain the Penn Wartman Belmont Sutter situation where you have a certain list of developments and then in the final hour you might it might change or switch to a different development? Um, it would be helpful to know what is happening there so we can better understand the process and even explain what's going on to our constituents. So can you explain that Penn Wartman Belmont Sutter? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we you know, I mentioned during the testimony and in response to some of the earlier questions, how we refreshed the, you know, the, the site selection process and how we, you know, do our methodology essentially and, and ad identify potential sites for the program. Um, when we were doing that and we sort of took a look at the broader neighborhood, you know, we realized that there were these sites that were proximate to Linden and Boulevard. And we thought that it would make sense to uh, pair these projects together so that you'd have some common management um, and, and there would be a greater benefit to residents in that way because what would be left behind are sites that are sort of scattered around that NYCHA would then struggle. We know NYCHA would struggle to manage those particular properties. So from a, from a logistic standpoint and a service standpoint for the residents, we thought it would make sense to include those. Um, I know we've, you know, we've been making efforts to, to uh, engage the residents uh, at those specific sites that were added. Um, I think, again, Leroy and Simon can sort of chime in with the exact specific uh, steps that we have taken, um, and we will do what it takes to ensure that folks understand and we'll incorporate their, their input. Okay, and so it'd be a great opportunity now to explain the actual process, just a, a quick run through. You come up with the list, you submit it to the mayor's office, and then you submit the package or the request to HUD, and then that's approved based on the list that was submitted, or is it just units that are submitted and not development? So can you just briefly explain that process of what is actually, um, has to be approved by HUD? Sure, but just if to be any? clear, lo sure, long before we, you know, get any approvals by HUD or City Hall or anybody else, we engage the residents. And I, again, I will turn to Leroy and Simon to describe what we were doing. Once we've identified some sites that we think make sense based on the methodology I outlined earlier, we then engage with residents and we start to have the conversation around what is actually needed on this site, both from a physical needs perspective, but also you know, social services and other amenities that would be useful to the residents. Um, and then we take it from there. So Leroy and Simon, do you want to sort of go through some of the specifics that we go with the residents before we even get to the point of submitting anything to HUD? Okay, so wait, stop right there. Mm -hmm, right. So right now, what has been submitted to HUD? Right. With respect to what? Right now, as we stand, so, okay. In the presentation, you mentioned, um, you know, 9,517 have been converted. 11,860 units are in the active PAT conversion now. And so that total, 24, whatever that number is, um, has, have those, is that the total number of units that were submitted to HUD for approval for PAC? I mean, for RAD, PAC, or, you know, so explain that, or is there another number that has been submitted? And what are those units or developments that were included in that particular process, just to get an understanding. 
So the 9,500 and change units that have already gone through and converted, all of that has already been reviewed, approved by HUD and everything. So those are done. The <clears> balance <throat> are going through the process. Um, so that's the 11,860 uh, active packed? That is correct. That is going um, through the approval process or no? Well, there's a couple of categories. Some of them are earlier in the process. We're just beginning engagement. Others have already gone through a uh, procurement process and we have development teams that are starting to do their scoping. Uh, they're going in and doing inspections and starting to really frame out what a scope of work is going to look like. Um, and I would turn to Marissa to speak on some of the specifics about which forms may have been submitted to HUD with relation to which projects. Truth to Hi, yes. Um, so the HUD approval process really runs in parallel with the engagement process. And because, um, as we mentioned before, for these developments, some of them are unfunded developments, they all have to go through various offices at HUD to be approved. And so um, we, NYCHA has what we call the, the portfolio award authorizing up to the 62,000 units. But we're in the process of making those submissions to HUD and really the HUD approvals don't happen um, really until we get closer to the, the, the actual conversion date. Um, so that's, that's sort of hopefully I can, the answer to your question. Well, Madam Chair, let me ask you about Penn Wortman. Where are they in this process? Because they've had people coming in scoping, people coming in making alterations, people coming in doing, what is it, the HSQ? And they were never told prior to that that they were being considered. So you seem to not be consistent in what you're saying. Are they have, have they been submitted to HUD at any point in your process for consideration? Because they're just now hearing about it. And now you're having meetings. You had a meeting last week. You tried to have a meeting two weeks before that, but the tenant said no. So where is Penn Wortman? To be specific, have you applied for Penn Wortman to be a part of this VAD project? We have we not, have, oh, sorry, Simon. Okay, we have go not ahead. submitted the application to HUD yet, specifically for Penn Workman. Um, it's underway, but we have not submitted it yet. Uh, with respect to Thank the you. inspections, it, I can continue or not. Well, uh, with, in terms of the inspections, we did at the request of the resident leaders uh, issue a request for a cease and desist because they're very concerned about people coming into their apartment during this health pandemic. And we did get a, a notice that yes, they will stop. We got a commitment that they will not go in unless it's something of an emergency nature. So that from the residents on behalf of their concern. And they were also told that they were asked to sign a letter of affirmation, which means, oh, to me, it sounds like saying a disclaimer, listen, we know it's a pandemic and we need to get this information. So just sign that you know that there's a risk involved. That's what it sounds like to me. I haven't seen the actual document. So that, um, that was meant to just document that the resident authorized someone to enter their unit. Right. So these are, these are pre-development inspections so that the development team can understand really what the conditions are in the units. Um, and so that those papers are meant to document that the resident has, has authorized someone to enter their apartment. They do not have to authorize anyone to enter their apartment, but as you know, um, okay. we've halted inspections. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Chair. Okay, so you, Marissa, you were just talking about the inspections. And so the inspections is to take a look to see what the internal um, repairs are needed so that you get an overall picture of our budget as to what the needs are and what the deal should should be or, or am I in the, the right lane right now? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. I mean, it's real. so one of the requirements from HUD actually for the RAD program um, is that the full physical needs of the development are addressed. And so the only way the developer can do that is to understand what the full physical needs are. And so going on site, getting in, you know, inspecting the, the boilers, the building system, the roofs, you know, all of the issues. Um, they engage third-party environmental consultants, really digging into every element, um, you know, the landscaping that needs to be improved, really every element of the, of the buildings um, and the developments and the grounds and the systems. 
to understand. So that's, okay. that's the reference to the inspections. Okay, and so that's helpful to know. And um, and Jonathan, you mentioned um, when talking about the funding for the repairs needed specifically, and then you mentioned boilers um, for the converted units to Section 8, you said they will absolutely, like absolutely will be addressed in the RAD deals. And so um, I just wanted to, to highlight that and ask about that. They will absolutely, so all of the repairs that are needed, not just in the internal, in, in the units themselves, but the overall building infrastructure, infrastructure yeah. like the roof, the boilers, everything yeah. will building be system. addressed yeah. in the RAD deal. So when you say will be, is that happening like concurrently now or like will be in the future? Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, so right now, let's say Armstrong is going through a conversion process, right? They're in the middle of their conversion. All of the infrastructure needs, capital repair needs from the rooter to the tutor, from the, from the, from the basement to the, to the rooftop are being addressed with the current RAD conversion, every single thing. That is correct. Yes. The point of the PAC program is to bring about comprehensive repairs to all of the buildings. So again, that is building systems, common areas, roofs, exteriors, uh, you know, recreational space, what have you. And of course the apartments, it is comprehensive. It gets into everything and ensures that it, wherever so there, there are deficiencies. No, that, so there's no development that has either gone through the conversion or going through a conversion now that have not had all of their needs addressed. The reason why I'm asking that question is because I was specifically told that there are developments that still have needs, even though now they have a new bathroom, a new kitchen right. and new floors, but the some of the overall infrastructure problems have not been addressed. And so I just wanna, I, I, I wanna make sure that we're being clear in the question and getting the answer because I have heard the exact opposite in some of these developments. So I just want to make sure that. Sure. I mean, I, I don't know which projects you're talking about specifically. I mean, look, there are going to be some projects where the renovation is ongoing. Um, so again, perhaps the ones that you've been made aware of, the construction is still occurring. Um, and so, of course, all the systems have not been dealt with yet. But by the end of the total renovation, it will be. Um, if there's something else that is of concern, I would certainly be interested to know what so that is. So it wouldn't be a situation we... where a conversion has been completed and next year they would need to go in and break up walls because there's a need to go in and do a, a you know, a, a, a repair need that, that was known at the time of the actual conversion. We won't see anything like that. Correct. So let's use the most recent project. The Manhattan Bundle closed November 30th. They have about three years to go through the entirety of the 1700 units that are part of that bundle to make comprehensive repairs. So yes, there's going to be different stages and phases of construction between November of 2020 and 2023. But by the end of that, they will have comprehensively repaired all of those buildings within that project. And then the point is to not have to go back and break open walls and do all this patching up because they would have fundamentally addressed all of the issues as part of the rehabilitation. John, and that is the same. May I add that during our process of engaging on residents that they help flush out that scope, right? Um, we talked about residents um, being, you know, masters of their own developments, right? They know the development better than all of us do because they actually live there. So yes, a inspector or NYCHA, whoever can come and give a list that yes, you need a new boiler. Yes, you need um, facade work. But they're the ones that's gonna be telling us when it rains but, um, and the A um, row in this particular building, there's a leakage problem, right? So those are the things that, you know, we are working with residents to complete that scope of work. So it's just not, you know, NYCHA or this inspector that's coming in saying we know it all. So we definitely work with residents on this entire thing. We make sure that um, you know the resident association is at the seat of the table throughout the entire process to make sure that it's a full comprehensive scope of work. So this is not to do um, band-aids, um, as residents have said many, many um, times to us that that's what we do. This is to actually do the full need of that particular development. 
So if there's specific questions or a resident might have, because again, it could take at least it's 18 months to do a full renovation, depending on the size of the development. But like um, Jonathan just said, depending on how many units, it can take upward of three years and they might not understand the mechanics of, you know, we have to do this first in order to do this. So we can definitely, you know, if you let us know what development that is, then we can definitely double check to make sure you fully understand and the residents understand what's happening. And, and just a quick question to follow up. Um, you mentioned the HUD RAD requirement, the inspection requirement. There's a set, what's the other requirement um, to make sure that all of the units in NYCHA are, you know, um, safe and um, and healthy? What it, there's a there's two separate requirements, correct? Inspection requirements. Chair, do you mean after after the packed conversion under for packed conversion? Prior to, but a, a, a nitro development that's not even involved in the packed conversion, just a, a HUD requirement um, to go in and address the infrastructure okay. needs or needs of a particular apartment. There's, there's an inspection two. that's required, right? Yeah, there's two um, inspections I know that we do, right? We have the FOS inspection, mm -hmm. and I think that's the most common for public housing that um, happens in each development to see what's going on. You know, they only do a percentage of the um, units and the overall developments that come up with our PNA. And then for um, the PACT and RAD, we do the housing quality standard, HQS, um, to make sure that we get a full comprehensive um, look at all the needs of a development. Is that, okay. those are the two okay. that you were yeah, talking so about? The, so the FOS inspection, if you go into a particular unit, even the ones that are just a sample or, you know, like a certain, a, a certain number, um, do you see a difference between what was required of the FOS inspection and what's required of the um, RAD inspection based on HUD requirements? Yes, I would, I would say overall, I would say it's a more in depth um, HQS because you know in RAD, we make sure before any conversion happens that an inspection is done in every single unit. Where, of course, in the other inspection, we're taking samples. So I would say we definitely see differences because now we can see all of the work that's happening in developments. Um, you know, we might, um, with going into that 25% or whatever we have to go into, it might be that we only see that there may not be any issues here, but on the other side of the building, there might be. So we do see a difference because you get into more units, you talk to more people, um, residents point out to, um, to us, and we make sure that they understand they have to be able to tell us what is it that their experience is because without their knowledge and then the knowledge we can actually physically see, we're not going to get the full comprehensive, um, you know, right. listing of um, items that need to be um, tackled. Yeah, and I'd also like to add that there, there are two different standards, but then apart from that, there's um, inspections that aren't HUD, HUD inspection, HUD mandated inspections that the development team is doing to understand the scope. And there they may be looking at things that aren't um, that aren't necessarily covered by the FAS or the HQS inspection. So, for example, if they're seeing systemic issues or a line of apartments that all have you know similar issues, they can because they've been brought in and can, and can actually address you know root issues, underlying issues that might be plaguing the building, not on a unit by unit basis, but systemically. That's what the development team is coming in and looking at, which may not be. Um, and I'm not an expert on, on FAS or HQS inspections, but that might not be addressed by a unit by unit inspection. Okay, thank you. I have one more follow-up question from Councilmember Barron before we go to Councilmember Gibson's question. Um, <laughs> uh, Councilmember Barron asked about the wait list and, um, and Lakeisha was going to, um, to speak, but I just wanna make sure that when we're talking about the wait list, is that the same wait list as the overall NYCHA wait list that you know, folks are on for, you know, a thousand years, or Lakeisha, were you going to speak to uh, the wait list, a different wait list? All right, um, that is the Section 8 wait list, and that's part of RAD from the public housing wait list. Any applicants on the public housing wait list can also place their name on the wait list for any converting development. So the list is kind of refreshed because it's a, a new indication of interest, and we would pull from those wait lists and um, everyone has to meet the Section 8 standards of being 50% of um, AMI. Oh, okay. 
So, Councilman Barron, I wasn't sure when you were mentioning that if 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 it sounded as though they were right. talking about the same wait list, right. but it's a different Section Eight wait list. Right, Section Eight wait list, and that's restricted to up to fifty percent. Yes, any new applicants coming in have to meet the Section Eight standards. Okay, great, thank you. And can no. you explain that a little more um, in detail, Lakeisha? Because Clearly, is we receive phone calls stating, I received a letter, and this one recently was from um, someone in uh, Farragut Houses, and said that um, I, I have an opportunity to apply for Section 8. And then she told her neighbor, and her neighbor didn't receive that letter. And so the question was, you know, um, you know why, can some, why is it that some people are able to apply for Section 8? and some are not. So can you just kind of flesh out what does that process look like? Yes, so I'm not sure what happened with Farragut, but as the properties are converting over to RAD, anyone who has an active application on the public housing wait list can then go and place their name on any of the converting properties, the section eight wait list that gets created for those particular properties. So if someone doesn't have an active public housing application, they cannot apply for Section 8 because Section 8 is not open for the general public. It's only open to someone who has an active application on the public housing wait list. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, okay, Audrey. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Gibson, you have five minutes. Okay, thanks so much. And thank you again, Madam Chair and everyone for your participation today. And I really want to recognize all of the tenant leaders. I represent many developments in the West Bronx, um, including Claremont Consolidated. And so this is a very important topic to me. And I've done, you know, my best over the last year working with the team on the ground in terms of the outreach. And, you know, the honest truth is we have a lot of work to do. Uh, NYCHA, you have not convinced our tenant leaders on the ground that this is the best course of action for them and their families. I recognize the decades of underinvestment and disinvestment of NYCHA from the feds, the state. I realize something has to be done. I just want to be a part of the conversation and making sure that this is the best approach and really making sure that there's a lot of advocacy on the ground. But so far, NYCHA, you have a lot of work to do. You're not winning the game on the ground, and that's why we are asking so many of these questions. So I just read through the testimony a little bit just to understand. I, I know about RAD and PAC, uh, this is not new to me, uh, but I, I have a couple of questions just to make sure that the interior exterior work uh, that has been cited really is included. So yes, roof, boiler, elevator, exterior, all of that very important interior apartment upgrades. As Maria Forbes said, for some developments, we have fire escapes. What are we doing with that is my first question. The second question I wanna understand the social service component, the partnerships that we will have with the local not-for-profit, what does that look like in terms of time frame, their responsibilities, their expectations, and what we expect them to provide in terms of services? So I do know Catholic Charities at Batances in the Bronx. I see the work they're doing. It's great work. So is that one of, one of the models that we should expect in the other developments? The third thing are the tenants associations and recognizing the TA resident associations moving forward. We give council discretionary funding that typically tends to be a lot more flexible than the TPS funds. So I wonder how that process will work moving forward. Can council members still provide support? Does it go through the not-for-profit? How do we make sure that we can still give money for our RA so they can have programs and operate, you know, family days and other things of that nature? Um, the size of this particular proposal, it wasn't in the testimony, but I do know that this is a large one with a lot of developments. I am concerned about capacity for NYCHA on the ground. Since you keep saying that you're going to maintain ownership and oversight accountability, uh, this is a lot of developments. And when you talk about a place in the Bronx like Edenwall, the largest NYCHA, uh, it is concerning to see and, and understand that we have the capacity in this phase to deal with all of these developments. So my question is, it was asked before about delaying 
Uh, what about scaling back? If this is moving forward, do we have to have all these developments in this particular phase or can we consider our different options? Um, the final thing I wanna mention is moving forward and, and looking at um, some of the existing management companies that we have in the city. I swear, management companies are like the uh, those that build comfort stations. They're so far and few. We don't have a lot of opportunity and diversity in the pool of management companies. And you can never find a management company where everyone loves them, right? It's a give and take. There's always good, there's always bad. So how do you determine what management companies that you'll be working with moving forward? Is it left up to NYCHA or the private entity? Um, and how do we move forward? And then the final question, because I always have an extra, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, with the first panel around community engagement, uh, what do you see yourselves doing differently that you have not done? And how do you move this process forward when there is so much uncertainty, there's so much anxiety in a COVID world? Uh, we know something needs to be done. Patience and understanding is something that NYCHA residents have done their whole lives. And I don't know how much more time we can ask them to be patient and understanding when they're living every day in conditions that are not conducive, not up to standard and not quality as they rightfully deserve. So if you could just answer those questions and if there's follow up needed, I'm happy to uh, talk to you offline. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so a lot of questions there. I'll try to answer them all in the time allotted. So you asked about fire escape. Um, yes. Residents are going to be involved in the scoping of what this look of what the project would look like. Um, so you know, I don't know what the answer is at this particular moment, but in, again, part of the theme of this whole conversation is through the engagement and participation of residents, we'll have a clearer sense of what uh, what folks want and what can be done. Uh, through that process that would happen during uh, the investigations. Um, you asked about social services, partnerships with non-for-profits. Um, again, I would turn to Leroy and to Simon or, or a lot of work that we're doing on that front to really bolster that effort. Yes. Did you wanna chime in there? So um, once a social services um, provider is um, part of a project, they make sure to go around to every um, unit in the entire um, development to talk to um, residents. And of course, um, now with COVID, we probably would have to do something very different. Um, again, we work with resident associations to come up with the type of questions and uh, figure out what types of programs they want to bring in. Um, you know, like you said at um, Batanzas, right? Um, they do great work over there, but they didn't come up with this by themselves. They really sat with residents, they sat with resident association um, members and came up with a full um, suite of services that were needed for their particular development. There is no one size fit all um, for any social services provider. It really comes from the um, information we receive from residents, understanding what is it that they're going to need. Maybe it's a on-site uh, social worker because we have a lot of elderly people there. Maybe it's a community um, center because we don't have community after school programs. Whatever it is that their particular needs are, that's the job of the social services partner to make sure that's brought in. Okay. Um, I can answer, I'm sorry, a question about um, TPA and RA. So again, we did mention RAs do um, go over when we do a conversion, so they still will be recognized. Um, TPA funds, any current um, TPA funds that they have currently will be moved over to the um, management company to work with them so, so that the residents can get the funding. So it doesn't go away. And then going forward, they will get the full $25, $25 per dwelling unit per year in order to do their particular um, work that they would like to do in their communities. And I still see um, council members give discretionary funds to um, um, resident associations. Some can actually get it themselves because they have 501c3s. And I know I know Maria Forbes is on here and she actually has one. So you can actually give it to her association directly. Um, and then others have worked with the social services providers because a lot of them are 501c3s and they will be the pass through for the funding, um, which will be a shorter process for them. When we get money at NYCHA, you know, things take, can take a little bit longer. Um, so, you know, with CPA funds, discretionary funds, any type of funds can work through um, the social service provider and management. Um, and I think there was also a question about asset management capacity. 
mm-hmm. um, or sorry, and property management rather. So um, first, what we go through is this competitive development developer and uh, team uh, uh, procurement process and property managers are part of that, those teams. Um, what, one of the things that we are looking to do is really open up our process. Um, we actually do a two-step process. First, we do a pre-qualification phase, and then we do uh, the specific site-by-site proposals, call for proposals. And one of the things that we want to do is really open up the RFQ to really broaden and deepen the bench of uh, property managers. Um, just one, to get more numbers, more folks, more teams within the system so that we can have additional capacity. And we also want to bring in property managers um, that are more local, that know the neighborhoods, um, and so that they can better serve the, na- the the specific residents within each neighborhood within which they operate. I think we. My, no, my last question was on capacity. How many developments are in this particular proposal uh, that will be sent to HUD? Sorry, which proposal specifically? Uh, in, in terms of RAD. Uh, well, right now we have. Are you talking citywide? Right now we have 11,000 that are going through the process. Um, if you were asking citywide, I don't know if you're asking. I am citywide, right. Citywide, there's, there's about a 11, just over 11,000 that are still going through the engagement process with residents and the scoping process. And then we'll be going through the HUD process uh, once we get through those earlier stages. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I, I know this is not the last time we will speak. I encourage you to continue to engage with us. We are talking to our RA leaders on the ground. There are weekly calls that many leaders in the Bronx have engaged in. And I think everyone is very, very concerned about how we move forward, how we support housing, how we preserve affordable housing in New York City, which seems to grow unaffordable every day. And at the end of the day, we have investments. And I've supported public-private partnerships in the past. I know government cannot do it by itself. I agree and am optimistic about this new administration, but I know that they can't solve everything, right? Um, And so at the end of the day, I realize something has to be done. So I do think, again, a lot of work needs to be done on the ground, language access and talking to residents. And as it was mentioned before, you, you have to talk to residents before people start coming into apartments and you start seeing folks in their buildings and developments. I think that's kind of, you know, disrespectful that it appears that work is already starting without any approval process. And I realize things have to be done, uh, but I think if you engage and talk to folks on the ground, they're less likely to curse you out because you haven't given them the due respect that they rightfully deserve. Um, and so I thank you guys. Uh, I'll have more questions later on and I can you know, do my offline conversations, but thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership and for everything you've done. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, we've also been joined by council member Ayala, um, if I didn't mention her earlier. Um, So jumping into the project management questions, um, on December 9th, PIX11 reported that the bias case, which gave protections and resources to NYCHA tenants to help abate mold, would no longer apply to NYCHA apartments that were converted to private management, such as the PACRAD program, since the private management company would be responsible for mold removal and repairs. So is this accurate? Is it the now the responsibility of the private management company to address um, mold issues and mold abatement? Well, if your question is about bias specifically, um, there's- My question is not engaged. bias specifically. My question is okay. about the property management part, property management, yeah. molds and responsibility. So again, yes. So again, as we've been saying, the purpose of PACT is to complete comprehensive uh, renovations of all of our buildings. So as part of that, they are, as it relates to mold, they are specifically charged and legally responsible for addressing the mold issues. So part of what is, uh, part of what happens is, you know, when we first select folks, um, you know, and they start to do the scoping, they're going in, they're doing inspections, they're understanding what, what the conditions are, and they are mapping out both a capital plan as well as an ongoing uh, operations and maintenance plan to deal with mold. Um, and then, you know, we will be giving folks, uh, development teams, uh, the work orders, the existing work orders that we have. Um, that typically happens uh, about six months before the closing, and then we refresh about 10 days before the closing. And then um, that is to, to give development teams a real sense of 
you know, what, what has been formally uh, logged within the NYCHA records, but also it supplements uh, their own inspection. So they, th between the two, they're developing a really comprehensive plan to get to the systemic causes of mold and make sure that when they go into the buildings and they do the renovation, they're really getting to the source so that the mold isn't just treated, it is actually eliminated on a permanent basis. So, okay, so my question is, when the conversion happens and you have these um, needs for mold abatement, how do you know or how can we be certain or how do we ensure that it's actually happening once the new property manager takes over? I mean, I so, understand that you're saying that, you know, there's a, uh, you, you, you take a look at the work orders, you submit that six months and then whatever amount of days prior to the, to the actual conversion is completed, you do that. And then I know that there's an assessment that is done when you're even having a discussion with the residents to figure out they should go through the program but you know the needs, everyone knows the needs, the property manager knows the, the folks that are coming in to take over management know the needs. So can you explain how, how, how there can be a situation where that property manager is not addressing all of those needs? So part of what I went over at the, in the testimony was the design of the team. And so we have built out a design and construction team as well as an asset management team. And so those two teams are going to be sharing responsibility for, um, in, for monitoring really what's going on. So the design and construction team will be going out inspecting um, and ensuring that the work is actually happening pursuant to uh, our agreements and pursuant to law, et cetera. Um, and then once the construction piece is done, the asset management team will continue to monitor uh, the progress of the projects on an ongoing basis. Now, um, you know, residents, can certainly continue, they have a lot of different avenues uh, to, to address concerns if, if they feel like they're not being addressed. Um, first is the first line of defense would be to work with the PACS property manager. If that's not working, they can contact NYCHA through our customer contact center. Um, and then if that doesn't work, uh, they could then go through uh, HPD and request an inspection. So there's a, several layers to ensure that the work is happening, but it is our, plan and expectation that it would not get to that far level, we are going to be monitoring these projects um, from closing on through renovation and on an ongoing basis to make sure that all of the work is done pursuant to our agreements. Okay, so are there any um, issues right now currently of a rad pack conversion that has taken place and residents have complained that their, um, the issues in the apartments are not being addressed? Are there any issues happening now? related to that? Um, you know, people, people, you know, file work orders, they place work orders with the property managers. Those are addressed on a regular basis. We are getting reporting. We have not seen any systemic problems when there are issues that come up um, to our knowledge uh, and everything that has been provided to us thus far, these issues have been addressed. So there are not lingering problems that exist. Okay, okay. Um, in 2016, Ocean Bay Houses in Far Rockaway was the first, de first development to be transferred under the RAD program. When NYCHA managed Ocean Bay Houses from 2012 to 2015, how many eviction proceedings were brought by NYCHA? And what was the most common reasons for NYCHA to begin an eviction proceeding? And after the RAD conversion from 2017 to 2019, do you know how many households were evicted? And what was the common reason for the private management company to begin their eviction proceedings? Sure. Um, I'll just say generally, and then I'll turn it over to Lamar, who's the head of our asset management team, who can give you some specifics. Um, over the all of our projects, the full 9,500 conversions that we've done, we've had 64 uh, evictions. Um, and I can also say that we have developed a program uh, last year, in October of 2020, we developed a program where we are working with packed partners to ensure that they are absolutely minimizing evictions. We wanna make sure that it is a true, true last resort. Um, for example, sometimes folks have gotten into some issues financially and they stopped paying rent and then they set themselves up for an issue. We wanna make sure that both the developers and our property managers, as well as the residents are, they clearly understand that they can go through the recertification process. They can have their rent adjusted based on any changes in household income. So that's just one example of what we're trying to do to minimize um, 
evictions going forward. But Lamar, can you provide some of the statistics uh, from both pre-conversion and current? Sure. Uh, so between 2012 and 2015, uh, there were uh, 57 total evictions that took place at Ocean Bay. Um, these were uh, over sort of cases, um, some non-payment cases, non-desirability, body house, chronic rent delinquency, uh, and, and holdover cases um, were part of that makeup of the uh, 57 total uh, uh, eviction cases that took place at Ocean Bay. Uh, since Ocean Bay has converted uh, over to the uh, PAC portfolio, uh, there have been 51 evictions uh, at Ocean Bay since then. Most of these evictions uh, had to uh, or, or took place around uh, cases of abandonment of apartments. Um, there were court actions that were required in order for those units to become inhabitable again um, by family members that were in the Section 8 program. Okay, I just wanted to, uh, to bring that, you know, just of some attention because, you know, that number does, it, it feels significant. It, it feels like, you know, a situation where, um, you know, the fear of when the developments are converted, you know, is just a way to kick people out. You know, that's one of the, um, one of the serious concerns from residents, right? And that's something that, you know, has to be addressed and, and has to be, again, communicated um, in a way that, you know, people can understand what's going on. Because again, that's a significant number for a recent um, conversion, uh, you know, 51 families, that's... So I think, I think we, we really understand that, 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 that sentiment and, um, and have been really taking measures to be able to monitor uh, how residents that ha are actually in the PAC portfolio um, how property managers are addressing any type of concerns that may uh, position them to become evicted or displaced. Um, and, you know, part of that has been regular reporting that we are receiving from the property managers that outlines exactly what type of, 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 of resources uh, the property managers are providing those residents with to ensure that they are receiving um, uh, consistent information that is going to allow them to uh, come out of or, or, or help them to come out of whatever uh, situation may be exposing them to displacement. Um, so that is, that is something that we have been doing. We have found a lot of support uh, from our partners in this, in this program. Um, we are continuing to scale it up um, uh, so that we are uh, receiving this data and, and can be on top of the follow-up and procedures um, to be able to support uh, this process uh, uh, to make it as successful as possible. And, and so Lamar, do you know uh, now how many folks, just a second, Brian, do you know now, um, like, so you're receiving this data, this information from, from your partners. Um, do you have a sense in each conversion, how many folks are struggling um, you know, who, who's on the list for a possible eviction and, you know, like what, what's happening with them? Like, are you doing something about that now? Like for each conversion? Sure, yeah, so we, we do receive the data um, and we receive the data on a regular basis. And then we have numerous follow-up with the property managers to uh, essentially go through the reporting that they're providing us, um, looking at details around what type of, uh, of support uh, they're providing uh, the particular residents, ensuring that the actual uh, data that is being uh, uh, incorporated into the reporting that they're providing us, um, it, it, it makes sense that we're, we're clear in the interpretation of the data itself. Uh, we follow the data uh, from uh, the point where a resident may, um, may not be in a particular legal matter, but maybe having some problems uh, initially up front uh, of being able to stay 
with, stay up with their rent. And so we are seeing what kind of resources are provided to those residents at that point. Um, and then also we are, we are working with the property managers to provide them with resources that we hear of, that we 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 hear of through our position, um, uh, to ensure that they are passing on those same resources to their residents. Okay, who who on your team is responsible for that um, follow up or liaison with the the partner? Is there a specific person, or is there is there a certain um, like job description? Is who is that? The, the responsibility falls under the asset management team, which I am, I am vice president of. And so it is, it is our team that uh, are collecting the reports, but it is also our team. We are also working collaboratively with uh, other departments at NYCHA that uh, have experience in understanding how to work with uh, tenants and, 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 uh, and, and what resources are available out there to be able to connect those residents with to just ensure that we are providing additional resources to the property managers. Um, they are also helping uh, other departments help us to go through the data um, and identify any potential uh, uh, red flags that may be there and help us in supporting in our feedback conversations with property managers. Okay, and just right. report. Oh, can I just add one thing? Okay. I, I do want to add that again, the social services provider that's on the grounds, you know, that's really part of their prayer view, right? If a person has issues and concerns, a non payment, um, can't fill out particular paperwork, all of those things can be assisted by those particular social services providers. So I don't want it to be like, you know, uh, under NYCHA where, you know, people always say social services never, you know, anywhere and we can't find them and nobody's ever coming. They actually have a partner on the particular grounds to help with all of those things. So you know, I just want to bring that to the forefront. Great. And, and also to uh, chair, if I can just add two of the 51 number, um, some of these apartments were um, had nobody living in it and uh, the um, manager went through the eviction process in order to turn the, uh, the apartment over. And some of these apartments also had no family that they could connect to. So there were people living there, but they were not connected to that apartment. Uh, and again, they, they went through the, uh, the tenancy action in order to get uh, a proper family you know, into that apartment who could tie to the subsidy. Okay, and you all know that I'm a I'm a, a, a data driven kind of person, and I love to you know figure out how folks are um, looking at data. Um, how do you share data between um, NYCHA and your partners, and what kind of data do you actually share? Just examples. So we are receiving regular reporting from our partners. Uh, we are asking them to perform uh, to provide details on. Uh, any rent delinquency, potential rent delinquency cases. Uh, we are asking them to provide uh, details on holdover cases. Um, and, and we are also asking them to provide details on cases on, on any rent delinquencies that may not have been uh, going through any type of formal proceeding at the time. So this is pre-proceeding information that- Outside of to, legal, outside of, of eviction proceedings, what other data do you, um, you know, do you share or, you know, like what other conversations? Are, and, you know, and, and I'm asking this question too, sure. because we are in the middle of a pandemic, right? And so we have been talking a lot about, um, you know, making sure that all of our developments and our residents are, you know, there's a way to reach out to them, make sure that they're okay, and to share data to make sure there's no one falling through the cracks. And so um, I just wanted to, you know, know that now that it's a private entity that is managing the development and not necessarily NYCHA that's connected with city agencies, um, you know, what other data are you sharing? And are you able to, you know, track to make sure that those seniors or folks that have, you know, ability challenges, are being, there's some kind of connection um, like just during this, this pandemic, the crisis that we're in. You know, that's a, that's, that's a really interesting point. At this time, we are not um, necessarily class uh, or having specific characterization around the households that are being reported at this, at this time. Um, I think that that's something that we can note. Um, but at this time, we are, you know, looking at 
the households as a whole and, and tracking any households that are getting into any type or, or, or can potentially be uh, an arrears or uh, an arrears or have a non-payment or a pre-eviction uh, uh, problem that may be arising. And so, and, and holdover cases, excuse me, that may be also uh, potentially arising. So we, we are not necessarily uh, looking at the size of the household or whether or not they are a senior resident. Mm -hmm. and, and so Brian, you see how that, that you see the concern that I'm talking about, right? Because mm -hmm. when we're talking about um, testing and tracing, we're talking about vaccinations, we're, we're talking about all of these things. And when we look at seniors and our NYCHA developments, those that are not in the senior exclusive buildings, those that are not necessarily in the HUD 202 buildings, the other list are seniors that live in the NYCHA developments, right? And so making, and they get a call, they're still connected to, you know, other organizations. And so um, that's an intentional call for, you know, a, a, a certain demographic within NYCHA. And so when you have these conversions, you, you know, just what happens to those? So I, I think this is the, I think this is the role, the exact role of the on-site social services. Um, so the, um, Catholic Charities, which was mentioned before, Abitantis, or Acacia Network, which has uh, done work in other places, they are there on site. They have staff on they have staff on site, and um, they are working with residents in those cases um, as well. I also know that opportunities were presented to us, um, and we were able to work uh, with many of the uh, converted developments around uh, food distribution. Um, and, um, you know, opportunities either by private or public, um, you know, opportunities. Cloth, which was a group uh, in, that worked with the Manhattan Bundle, uh, did an amazing job throughout the portfolio, uh, making sure that they gave out food during the pandemic. Um, and then the, the last thing, too, that we had lot of, lots of conversations with our partners was on sanitizing uh, protocols to make sure that um, there was a plan in place and folks, um, you know, it wasn't just that NYCHA had a plan, that there was a plan in, for all the uh, developments as well. Okay, okay, um, thank you. Um, my next set of questions are related to, you know, something that y'all have heard me say over and over and over and over and over and over. Resident management corporations, mm -hmm. resident management groups, part of the HUD 964 regulations, Leroy, you know I talk about this. <laughs> over and over and over and over and over again. Would NYCHA consider working with residents to create resident management corporations to help manage their portfolio and RAD pack developments? And would NYCHA be open to have resident management corporations manage a building? So can we just talk about, you know, what, what, you know what's, what are you doing around resident management corporations and um, looking to see, we already know that you know, with the with your chair, with Greg Russ, you know how he feels, and you know his experience with resident management corporations um, in the past. But you know, what do you, can you just talk about? Just what are you doing around resident management corporations and supporting residents who would like to manage their properties? So it is um, it's an interesting question, and uh, it's something that obviously has come up a lot of times in a lot of different forums. Um, that we have been considering. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of experience across the country of them working for a particularly long period of time, but I, I would say one of the things as I tried to emphasize through the testimony and you've heard again in response to all the questions is we acknowledge that the engagement and the input and all of the rest of that may not have been as robust as it could have been um, you know, at the very beginning. And we've been taking very concrete steps to enhance that. We know we're not there yet, but that's what we're doing. And as part of that, um, look, I think we would love to hear how it could work and see if there's a way, if there's a version of it that would work um, that would be a benefit to these projects. So Jonathan, let's not even start there, right? Because we know that there's been, there's been several across the country that have not worked. And mm -hmm. that is a conversation that I have had with the chair. And so now that we have lessons learned about what has not worked, how about we start to think of how to make it work based on the lessons learned from why it did not work, right? Because if we out here looking for one that actually worked, we will never get it done. And again, that's always the problem, right? It's the setup to fail. 
So how do we make it work? Let's have the conversation. Absolutely. And what I'll also throw out there is when we're talking about uh, management companies and we're talking about you know local management companies to come in because we see this this massive portfolio and looking at community based I mean community companies that know the area those are the same companies uh, or, or corporations that can go in and train residents or you know partner with residents and really you know come up with a, a program or a plan or an entity that works because if we have it already built into the law itself that this particular entity can exist right and you're also talking about putting funding into associations to assist them with hiring experts then what would it look like to put funding into associations to train and build the skill set of the residents to have their own management companies so they're not then using their money to hire these other experts or do different things when they can you know uplift themselves and empower themselves and and be able to you know we're looking at you know different economic opportunities um one of the slides said that the pack rat deals can lead to jobs you know this is also a job and so um i think this is low-hanging fruit and i'm not sure why we are not prioritizing this especially in this climate um you know i would hate to believe that it's a situation where you know you just don't want to because it's empowering residents to now manage and own but I, I, you know, I would, that's not the case, y'all. No, so, not, not at all. And so these and other ideas, yeah, these and all, a lot of these ideas are great and I certainly welcome them. And, you know, again, one of the themes that I tried to stress is this idea of partnership with all of our stakeholders. Um, look, and one of the things that I said also was that it's not just about fixing the buildings. We're looking at really improving the buildings and improving the communities. And that means providing the right services and the right opportunities. So. Certainly happy to expand the conversation beyond merely fixing the building. Yes, yes. So um, that'll be a, you know something else that we talk about as we're talking about section three and the funding for rad projects. That's that's a significant piece of it. Um, we just have a, a a couple more sections and then I'm I'm done with my questions and I don't think my colleagues have any other questions. Um, can we go? So we talked about HUD approvals. I want to just get on the record um, the actual process, the Section 18 process. Um, and just for background, Section 18 of, of the United States Housing Act of 1937 provides that public housing agencies may demolish or dispose of public housing with approval from HUD. In some of these PAC RAG conversions, NYCHA plans to use Section 18 process to have HUD issue tenant protection vouchers to residents and make the RAD conversion more economical as the tenants remain in their apartments. In the Section 18 legal documents, are the tenant rights codified? Are these units permanently affordable? And is there an expiration date to those documents? So it does admittedly get confusing with the way HUD uses its terminology. We are not seeking to demolish buildings or any of that sort of thing through the PAC program. It is an, un it is, the term is the term. And, but the point is when buildings have reached a certain level of degradation um, in terms of the, the physical conditions, they, we can get uh, a richer source of sub subsidy um, through this process. And um, that's why you're seeing these types of applications. And we expect that throughout the rest of this program, that it would be a blend of Section 18 units and RAD uh, units. But um, the point here is between RAD and our PACT program, all of the rights and the protections that come with RAD uh, are extended throughout all of the, the different mechanisms that are used to get subsidy from HUD. So absolutely, all of the rights and protections that I outlined in the presentation that I know you've all heard in other forums over the years, are going to be enshrined in these documents and those residents, um, you know, they will not see or experience anything different in their lives uh, compared to a RAD resident. 
they will get a brand new apartment with great systems and great, uh, you know, common areas and the rest of it, as well as social services and all the other good stuff. Uh, that's the good change. Uh, but in terms of their rights and protections, it is the same. And OK, so how many buildings does NYCHA expect to go through the Section 18 process? Well, as I mentioned, we imagine that it'll be a blend um, throughout the whole portfolio. So there'll be some RAD and there will be some Section 18. So theoretically, you know, we're almost all going forward. OK, so what does HUD require within Section 18 for resident consultation? Is there a, an actual, is there language that speaks directly to tenant consultation in the Section 18 process? Sorry, tenant complications? Consultation. Oh, consultation. Um, I believe it is the same. Uh, I don't think there's any difference, but regardless, we are going to be doing the same approach uh, for any of these conversions. We're not going to treat anyone differently as we go through. And with section 18, is there a requirement for consultation with elected officials? Um, I don't know offhand. Uh, I believe there is, but I can confirm that for you. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, and last set of questions uh, related to the NYCHA's blueprint for change. On December 12, 2018, Mayor Bill de Blasio announced NYCHA's 2.0 plan to fix and preserve public housing. NYCHA is now considering a new plan called the Blueprint for Change. What is this new plan? Um, just Can you just give us a, just a summary of what the new plan is, this Blueprint for Change? And how is it different from NYCHA 2.0? And can you provide us with an update um, about this plan? Like, where are you with this plan and speaking to residents? So, um, th thank you, Chair. Um, so the, um, the blooper for change gives us the ability for the first time to have an entire portfolio approach um, to take care of um, the needs of all of the units uh, common areas and, um, and also the grounds. Um, we will do this by creating uh, a new entity called the Public Housing Trust, which is a totally public entity uh, with a, a board that is uh, appointed by public officials with a public workforce, meaning the NYCHA workforce will, be, will work uh, in these developments um, and um, using public subsidy uh, and uh, you know, specifically uh, tenant protection vouchers. We will um, create this new entity. The units will be, uh, there'll be a land uh, disposition, a lease, um, and NYCHA will continue to own the properties similar to the PAC deals. Um, but uh, the uh, tenant protection vouchers are really important here because they are much more valuable uh, than your uh, regular voucher or public housing subsidy. With that uh, additional funding, we will be able to invest in the properties. And at the same time, we will, um, the legislation that we have in Albany will protect tenants' rights, will keep rents uh, where they are now, will make sure that the property is affordable um, forever because the new tenants coming in will be from the tenant waiting list. Um, and it also gives us procurement lease relief because as we all know, people often say, even when nature gets money, it takes too long for uh, the authority to spend it. Um, and the uh, contractors who are often hired um, do work that is uh, not at the satisfaction of, of the residents. Um, so under the legislation that we um, have been uh, very involved uh, with putting together, we look to achieve those goals. Um, it's a new session. It just started a, a few weeks ago. Um, we are having conversations uh, with um, first residents. Uh, we've been holding a, a town hall meeting um, every week. Uh, we've had nine uh, in total uh, with an average attendance of about 100 per meeting. Um, the chair is meeting regularly 
with uh, tenant association presidents um, in the uh, in, in tenant leadership. Um, and uh, we are also meeting with uh, community-based organizations, um, thought leaders and housing leaders throughout the city. Okay, so um, understanding that the public trust is a, um, the blueprint for change can only exist if there's a public trust for NYCHA. Is that the, like the gist of the blueprint itself? Like we know that the blueprint for change is a new plan and vision, but it can only exist if the state legislators vote on and approve the public trust. In order for the uh, public housing trust uh, to be created, we will need the state legislature to create this new public benefit corporation, that is correct. Um, and at the same time, we'll be working with our partners in Washington to make sure that the tenant uh, protection vouchers uh, are in place uh, in order to provide the additional funds. So who did, who developed the blueprint for change? Um, NYCHA, uh, NYCHA has been working on this plan um, since, um, you know, over the last year, and we've had many conversations with um, resident leaders, some elected officials, um, and also some industry leaders, looking at best practices on things that were tried uh, in other cities. I know that you've been to Cambridge, uh, where um, you've seen that model work, and obviously our chair has some experience in Cambridge, looked at, you know, models that have worked in other places and said, if it worked there, we could do this in, on a larger scale um, in New York City. Okay, and um, and the last thing, there was a hearing in December that was held by our state colleagues. And I just want people to be clear that this public trust, the bill is from assembly member Simberwitz and state Senator Kavanaugh. They held a hearing for the state legislators and a public hearing. It was not the city council, right? Um, but we clearly were listening to the hearing um, and had our own opinions. Can you um, just give us a sense of how did the hearing go? And um, like, where are you now with, uh, the blueprint for change and reaching out to residents. Where are you now? Are you taking a pause? Are you looking to, you know, change direction? You know, like, so has anything different, did, did you, are you doing anything different based on the outcome of last month's hearing? Sure, um, and, and let me just say, uh, so last session of the assembly introduced a bill that the Senate did not. Um, so uh, so we did have a, a assembly member Simbowitz introduced a, a, a bill. I think the hearing was really interesting, and it definitely um, we heard from a lot of a lot of people um, and some things that we need to do different. Um, and we are having um, many conversations with with residents. Um, yesterday, we held um, three separate uh, meetings with tenant associations, but the chair participated uh, in all of them. Uh, we're holding town hall meetings. We're having meetings by neighborhoods too. So we're getting entire neighborhoods together um, where there are clusters um, because you know folks talk to each other and they usually want to make sure that um, they know what's good for, because what's good in uh, East Harlem may not be good in Rockaway. And we, so we want to hear people's different experiences. Um, we did have very strong support from um, some advocates, from labor, uh, from some thought leaders. But you know the the voice that we need to hear more from, and the voice that we you know moving forward needs to always be the residents' voice first. And uh, moving forward, we got to make sure that 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 that's you know that's where we're leading, and that's where we have our foot forward. I think we can end there, Brian. What All do you right, think? thank you. You, you think sounds, we can end there with what you good. just said? Yes, I think so. What's necessary? <laughs> what's needed? I'll get a uh, button that says that. Okay. <laughs> I think that sums it up. Right. <laughs> um, Audrey, my phone died. I'm sorry. I don't even know if you text me to let me know if, if there were other questions. <laughs> I'll give it back to you real quick. <laughs> sure. It's 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 been a bit of time. Um, 
Uh, there doesn't seem to be any further questions from council members. So at this point, we will uh, wrap up this time and then move into testimony from the remaining members of the public. And I would also just like to thank everyone for staying on. I know uh, many of you have been waiting for some time to be able to uh, present before the committee. So thank you for your patience. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, um, and I just, uh, again, want to state that the purpose of these hearings and having the residents speak first is because they're the residents. This is their home, right? And we know what our families and neighbors have been going through for decades. And now is the time to just simply do the right thing. And, and I know that Jonathan, you know, I was kind of in my feelings when you put your slide presentation up and did not mention the residents first. Yeah, so that's a lesson learned. Um, and so overall, the theme today was the residents have not been included. It's not enough to say that you're receiving input and feedback. Residents are, they should be partners in every deal. They should be partners. And so I think that, you know, I, I, I like the concept of um, providing the associations and, and groups with funding to be able to really be a part of what's happening and be at the table, to be a part of decision-making, to be now at the table to select the developers and the management companies during the, the, the process itself. That is something that we have been um, pushing for. Um, and you all know I, have, I, I did visit Cambridge. I visited Toronto Public Housing in Canada. I've been to London twice last year. This is all, you know, looking to see some of the best practices around, around the country and around the world. Um, and so there's so much room for improvement and we know that. Um, and so I just hope that we are able to really um, move forward in the, in the direction that we should be going. So thank you so much. Um, and that is it from me. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, we will at this point turn to testimony from Members of the public, thank you very much for your patience. Please listen for your name as I will be calling individuals one by one. Uh, and I will also announce who the next person will be. Uh, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you. Uh, and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer uh, to announce when you may begin. Your testimony will be set to two minutes. Um, so at this point, we will begin with Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, followed by Mary McGee. Uh oh, all right. I'm ready. Thank you. <laughs> you ready to go? Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I just, I think I can contribute a little bit because I've listened to most of the hearing and I want to say two things. In my uh, borough, we have uh, Wise Towers and some of the scatter sites who are now going through this RAD project. And I don't think it's great. I have to be honest with you. At the same time, as you heard from Hector Vasquez, the project that discussed for a year and a half at Chelsea Elliott and Fulton works. That's what works. But in terms of what's happening now, despite the great efforts of NYCHA, just at Wise Towers, this is not enough ground staff. They haven't completed the project, but even the folks who are supposedly the, you know, um, social services group, they come from uptown. Why not use the group that is actually there? So. I don't like the fact that the community did not have any say about the RFP at all. So there's not enough staff. Um, when residents, uh, they can't really find, file complaints. They can't call the CC hotline. And when they do, their complaints get bundled with other properties. Um, the PRC, which is the PAC group, is installing bath fitters for apartments but they were told they were gonna get new bathrooms. Communication is not great. And I, want, I don't have a lot of time, this is going to be submitted, um, but it is not a good process. And I know that the people who you know, are doing this uh, management are constantly saying, um, we're working with them, Gail, we're gonna do a good job and so on. It has not been my experience. Second, I wanna accolades to the project at Chelsea, Elliott and Fulton. 50 people participated. Legal aid was at every meeting. Every elected official was at every meeting. The CSS was at every meeting. Tenants were front and center. Hundreds of community 
engagement real with the tenants leading the charge. That's very different than what I am seeing. These other conversions should not have taken place without that kind of discussion. And we shouldn't have any more conversions without a similar process. And I say that with all due respect to NYCHA, but I am not happy. So the process in which even virtually work because um, the tenants did the outreach, the tenants took the lead in the uh, workshops and the tenants were part of every decision. And as you heard from Hector, input to the RFP, it's from the tenants. I may not like that there's gonna be market rate housing, but the tenants are okay with it because they work through the finances. The tenants can give the finances better than you and I could ever do because they sat through all those meetings. At the same time, I got this other RAD and this other project at Wise Towers. I don't know what's in the RFP. The tenants don't know what's in the RFP. I had to fight to make sure that one's uh, community room wasn't taken over by the management when they needed the community room. I had to fight to get that back and get the bathroom back. Um, and when there was a fire there the other day, uh, we never saw the super. The tenants were out there telling uh, residents what to do and the fire department was great. So I'm going to submit this, but I don't think there's anybody else who's got that kind of experience with what it is that is in the process and versus a real planning. Pre-planning is what's needed. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I appreciate what you're doing. I don't know what this resident planning fund is because I just heard about it from your hearing. Um, NYCHA just does not know how to do outreach. I don't know if it's gonna change. And I understand you heard from some of the residents today that when there's a new management team, that's true. I still wanna make sure that, however, the same mailing list, um, I worry a little bit about those who are over income. I don't wanna lose them. How do you work with them? So there's still a lot of questions, but when there's not the real tenant input, it's not gonna be a good outcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Borough President. Um, I know every single uh, meeting that I go to, um, your staff is, if you, you're there or your staff is there. And so I know you know you are out there on the ground. Um, and so I have the same like issues and concerns, but I just want to know, did you do you have an opinion at all on this blueprint at all? Yeah, I think the blue, I think as people have said, yes, I've been briefed on it a couple of times. We brought them to the borough board. Um, I would say that if there is, again, we have not seen kind of the tenant input. If the, if the, if we get money from Washington, that's an if, um, and you know, it would kind of work like the school uh, construction authority where there's a separate entity. I have had such a good experience on the Clinton community, Chelsea community. That's the kind of process that we need in order to make that work. You know, it, it's like, if you don't have that process, what, for some reason, what's ever in the water at NYCHA cannot work with the residents. Okay. So yep. it, it's just, I don't know, I've been doing this work 40 years. That's how long, <laughs> Victor's longer. Yes, Victor, but not many longer. And I don't see the communication ever taking place, all right? So the concept of the blueprint, you know, Brian Cavanaugh thinks it's okay. So I trust Brian, Victor, I trust, you I trust, but it cannot take place with communication that is top down. And that's the problem. And you know, it just, it's like, I mean, I, you know, it just doesn't work. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't work. So that's where you have to have um, a different process. So the concept of the blueprint and the section eight and so on and so forth and the other entity, but who is the, who, who's the interface? Who, who's yes. doing that, that it would work? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. We will now hear from Mary McGee, followed by Jackie Laura and then Miguel Acevedo. Mary McGee. Your time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having this uh, meeting today. Um, I'm a resident of Fulton Houses. I'm also a member of the working group. There's a lot of issues that need to be addressed. NYCHA is like, it, it had a cancer that everybody ignored. So now the cancer has spread throughout NYCHA. 
And the ones who always pay the consequences are the residents. We're the ones living in horrid conditions. We're the ones being told that we have to take this rad pat program in order to live in decent uh, dwellings. Like, why does it take rad pat? Why has government failed us to the point where we don't have a choice? Presidents weren't given the opportunity. We pay our rents. Where has all this money gone? If HUD hasn't given them money that we should have been given, then our other governments, our other branches of government should have stood up and stepped in and put in that money. But you know what? That's the past. We're moving forward now. We're moving forward. And the residents still are not being heard. Excellent. You're reaching out to the TAs. You're reaching, you're, you're, you're talking to the tenant association presidents. But what about reaching out and talking to the actual residents? Find out their wants their needs, their concerns, their fears. We as residents are being ignored. Our voices are not being heard. When you offer us new roofs, new um, boilers, new elevators, new bathrooms, new kitchens, of course we want that. Of course it sounds good, but what price are we paying for it? What rights as residents are we giving up? You know, part of the working group, when they said there was a lot of fighting in the beginning, as you can tell right now, you see my passion? So I'm the one who caused all the fighting. I'm the one who tackled everyone and questioned everything. And, and the finances, I'm sorry, um, Borough President Brewer, the finances, I still don't know the numbers. I sat on that committee. I asked for those numbers. What I was given, what everybody else was given. Was I able to sit down and calculate those numbers? No. The other thing is, is that if RAD is such a good program, then why do you need to take the info? Because we are in a high valued real estate part of the city, New York City. And it's unfair that you have to do both to us and not just do one. But as for the working group, progress was made. And if I had to go rad packed, it would have to be the working group way because we fought hard for the rights of the residents. As for everything, it has to be understood that there wasn't enough resident outreach. I'm sorry, during the pandemic, this should have been paused. But if my arm is twisted, it would have to be the working group way, not NYCHA's way, because you know what? We don't trust NYCHA. And people need to understand that. Residents do not trust NYCHA. NYCHA says yin and is actually yang. So I ask of this committee to please put a pause to this. Please put a pause so residents can be heard. Please put a pause so our rights, our voices, and our concerns are being addressed before somebody from the outside, looking on the outside, you're just looking at numbers, at structures, but you're not looking at the heart of nature, which is us, the residents. And you're not hearing from us. You're talking to us. I thank you for your time and I hope you understand we matter. We can't say this is affordable housing. No, this is low income housing. And we need to understand that we need to maintain low income housing for the future generations and not make it disappear. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Jackie Laura, followed by Miguel Acevedo and then Manuel Martinez. Jackie Laura. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, my name is Jackie Jacqueline Lara, and I'm a Fulton resident for 18 years, and I'm also on the board as the secretary, and I was also on that working group. And I went into the working group hoping to preserve public housing, but um, their mind was already made up of which way this was gonna go. So um, I didn't wanna hear it anymore. Unfortunately, I didn't want to stay. I didn't want, I didn't, I didn't care for anything they had to say. I just wanted to keep public housing public. And our development is not deplorable. 
Our development, all it needs is probably $150 million just to restore it. But unfortunately, we have deplorable hearts out there that want to take our development and privatize it. Now, according to what I hear during this um, council here, um, the Knights is trying to wash their hands and it's not with hand sanitizers. So I don't know, um, they have to be accountable for this. I don't think they should get away and just start taking public housing away from us. I mean, like uh, Mary McGee said, we, you know, we need it for the next generation. I mean, my poor kids are paying $2,800 rents out there, which is not fair because affordable, they've been on that housing connect and they can't get nowhere. Now, um, I love where I live. I have a beautiful apartment. My apartment doesn't look like a NYCHA apartment. And there's a lot of apartments here that don't look like a NYCHA apartment. And if there are deplorable apartments out there, it's because they have a mental issue or they have a drug addiction or something's wrong. But otherwise, this development is beautiful and they've neglected it on purpose because now we can't even get any work done here. So they're letting our apartments get deplorable because they want it. And we live in a prime place where this is money for them. So they all, they're all lying. They're a bunch of liars. They took an oath to lie and they have a deplorable heart. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Miguel Acevedo, followed by Manuel Martinez, and then Safoni Joseph. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Miguel Acevedo. I'm the Tenant Association President at Robert Fulton Houses. I feel their pain, but I don't agree with them. I feel that NYCHA has worked wholeheartedly. The city has worked wholeheartedly. Every single elected official that represents our district has taken part from day one to make sure that this working group was resident driven. And as much as they say that they, we're not living in deplorable conditions, it is not true. We have a heating system there that is outdated. We have roofs that are leaking every day. We have elevators that are broken down. If something is not addressed sooner than later, I can guarantee you this development will in the next five to 10 years will be condemned. And this is, what, this is why, why I support this. And for people to say that it wasn't resident driven, it's not true at all. That committee met every single Tuesday for almost six months until the pandemic started. Then we met virtually, virtually to discuss how we can work together to make sure we get the finances that make sense are moving forward so this development and Elliot Chelsea, Chelsea Edition and Chelsea has what's needed financially. The infill building that's going on, the only reason why we support that infill building because it's gonna bring the finances that's needed to preserve public housing in Chelsea. Yes, it's true, we live in a neighborhood that's very expensive, but without this, they won't be public housing in Chelsea in the near future. They will find ways to tear Fulton and Elliott Chelsea down. So we need this project to move forward and NYCHA and City Hall and every elected official has worked hand in hand, even advocates throughout the city from not-for-profits, legal aid, right. have worked with us to make sure that our voice was heard first and foremost. So it was all about the residents not about the elected officials or city hall or NYCHA. It was about us to make sure we got what we wanted. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Manuel Martinez, followed by Saponi Joseph, and then Victor Bach. Your time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you. Um, and Good afternoon to everybody that's on the on the council. My name is Manny Martinez. I'm the resident council president for South Jamaica Houses. Um, my my testimony today is just, is in regard to the NYCHA 2.0 and also in how they are approaching this privatization on the whole uh, um, stock of NYCHA. So when they say preserving public housing, we have to understand that the transition from Section 9, which is public housing, to Section 8 is the elimination of public housing. There's no more. There's no longer public housing anymore. 
uh, when you're looking at NYCHA blueprint for change, the, the request, the proposal that they're making is to completely eliminate public housing. The verbiage of preserving public housing is really a, a, a misguided advertisement, right? You're not preserving public housing, you're transitioning it to section eight housing. Um, we also have to make the considerations that we have of fluctuations with chairs. This is just part of the history and the dynamic of all of these uh, agencies, especially the housing authority. So promises that are being made by one chair um, will not be consistent with the next chair that comes in, and we don't know what that time frame would be. Uh, there is another dynamic that we have endured. See, public housing in New York City especially has been a time capsule for uh, racial segregation, right? Uh, redlining. And redlining is is being, is very evident in no matter what community you're in, be it a predominantly black community like mine's or a mixed and, and affluent community like Chelsea's, right? The public housing development in, in that community still maintains in the same condition. It is not surprising, right, that we are experiencing these conditions in a similar fashion throughout the city and on a population that is that would be the 54th largest city in the country, right? Um, the consistency of this is what brings that needs to bring us pause. So we have we have to take in consideration that any kind of strategy put on top of this deficient work culture. Now, I want to preface the next comment with the fact that. I know many of great people who work for public housing. I've had the honor and pleasure of working with them. This is not indicative of all and everybody, but we do have a workplace culture that makes it impossible for the families who are to be served, to be respected. Uh, we are starting to see that repairs are being, the, the, the cost of repairs are being expanded by multiple visits, unnecessary visits, uh, in positioning residents, uh, harassing residents with forced drill outs, home invasions, with insufficient uh, notices being given back when they were doing the lead inspection. I've endured it. I've had to multiple occasions put a stop to drill outs in my development uh, two or three times because they got noticed the day of, I mean, uh, the day prior, on a Friday for Monday. And people work. And now the other consideration that we have to give is that although the average rent across the public housing uh, population is $550. If you were to look at uh, the working population here, which is predominantly 44%, I believe, and of the working population would make up 80% of the people who are working, right? The average rents are $1,150 to $2,800. Um, now in that price range, we are not exploring the strategies under section nine that's available, such as home ownership, uh, uh, making home ownership, an option. Uh, also, the stopping of exploitation of exploiting Section 3, which has been grossly exploited. It has recently come out that the Comptroller in his NYCHA transparency initiative had put out $19.1 billion in issued contracts from 2010 to 2020, just in the prior Section 3 before it was changed. There was a 10% mandate of subcontractors for Section 3 business concerns. That has never been engaged by NYCHA and is not being reported under the Comptroller's Transparency Initiative. That 10% represents $1.9 billion alone. So that's $190 million that our communities have been exploited for over the last 10 years for each and every year. We have many methods that we can engage in, such as raising the rents for residents through their income, through providing them uh, the opportunities that's available to them under Section 9. This RAD and also this blueprint for change is a separation of the residents and the, and the fair housing rights that they have, uh, as, as well as Title Seven rights, right, when it comes to economics. We cannot justify the separation of these rights on this massive size of population, right, to, to, in order to find a quick fix. Another thing that we need to engage on when you said about the resident councils and the additional funding, we need legislation. We need legislation that is going to enforce the 964, especially subsection 135 and all paragraphs within it. That's going to ensure that the resident councils and the residents have the ability to engage NYCHA in a manner that is intended. Right, not only through the letter, but the spirit of the law, so that we can make sure that we can accommodate the oversight of these processes. Um, we have been that the the communication with us has been improved, 
but there's still a, a, a lot that, you know, there's still a lot that is desired, that is desired. Um, and I also feel, and I put this on the council, uh, the public housing resident, the section nine resident needs to be a protected class. If, if, if anything right now, we have been symbol, a symbol of racism here in, in, in public housing with the conditions that have been imposed on us. Section eight right now has been, uh, 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 has been designated a, protect, a protected class under the source of income. Um, and public housing residents also need to be a protected class and we need to have our rights preserved. The issue now is people versus property and it's the specific type of people that have been devalued in the past and continues in this manner. We need to change this now. And uh, I look forward to, to the progress that you guys have been making. I am appreciative to the council. I'm appreciative to the, to the chair and, and to the public housing committee for the progress that they have been making. But we do need to set the pace for NYCHA in order for us to get the proper engagement and the services that we desire. Thank you so much for, for giving me this time to speak. And I wish everyone a happy new year and, and, and a blessed day. Take care. Thanks very much. We will now hear from Safoni Joseph, followed by Victor Bach and then Lucy Newman. Your time starts now. Hello, my name is Sophie Joseph. I'm a community planner and advocacy coordinator in the Equitable Neighborhoods Practice Area at Take Root Justice. Take Root works with grassroots groups, neighborhood organizations, and community coalitions to help make sure that our people of color, immigrants, other low-income residents who have built this city are not pushed out in the name of progress. We thank you for listening to our testimony. Um, this, his, this hearing is particularly crucial because NYCHA has been moving forward with the disposition of its property without you alert nor approval of this council. Our clients and partners who are and work closely with NYCHA residents have serious concerns about continued attempts to implement these programs during COVID-19, which directly inhibits inclusive public participation. Simply put, implementing such programs are not acceptable to our coalitions. This include TAV, organizing Asian communities, good old Lower East Side, goals, the Holmes Isaacs Coalition, Housing Justice for All, and the Justice for All Coalition. So PACRAD, how could residents lose that out? In transitioning from public housing to PACRAD, formerly NYCHA buildings will be taken out of the 2018 Baez versus NYCHA settlement and the 2019 Federal Monitorship Agreement. The Baez settlement currently requires NYCHA to adhere to strict practices in, rem in remediating chronic mold and water leaks and makes NYCHA answerable to the mold and leak ombudsman. Um, they have had success in forcing NYCHA to follow through with proper repairs, so removing them from oversight is not beneficial to residents. Furthermore, HUD has already granted NYCHA approval to convert 33 campuses. This is 76 buildings to Section 8 using the RADPAC programs. If these five campuses have already been converted and with repairs supposedly in progress, but these conversions have not been done with oversight from this council. So people who used to be NYCHA's tenants are now under private landlords. And when we looked at the draft fiscal year 21 annual plan, it includes an additional 20 campuses that are slated for um, transfer to private man. NYCHA admits that it has only applied to HUD for approval for these conversions, and yet they're already taking liberties with eight of these campuses, announcing specific developers to take over them without actually having HUD um, approval, presuming that HUD will rubber stamp its applications. Um, we thank you for the time that you've given us. Um, we've submitted our testimony. Please feel free to read through for more detailed information. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will now hear from Victor Bach, followed by Lucy Newman, and then Debbie Dominguez Higgins. Your time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, I'm Vic Bach with Community Service Society. Uh, it's late, I'll try to be brief. Uh, uh, in August 2019, we did do a survey of a sample of 275 grassroots NYCHA residents and asked them what they thought of RAD Pact. We found that they were evenly divided. About half supported the, uh, the idea and half opposed it. The major reasons for opposition were an objection to privatization and as well as fears 
of gentrification and potential uh, displacement. Um, obviously, there are policy issues that need to be resolved. Uh, ideally, they should be resolved through a process uh, in which preservation strategies go forward only after full resident engagement and ideally their consent. I think that's been a consistent theme throughout this, uh, this hearing. Um, and uh, as uh, uh, the chair, uh, Ampri Samuel put it, uh, NYCHA does engage residents and educate residents, but only after the basic decision is made as to whether to go forward with RAD, uh, with Blueprint and the like. Um, the um, uh, Chelsea Working Group already described by uh, 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 Gail Brewer, by Hector, by Miguel, is an unprecedented process through which uh, resident leaders, elected officials, um, and uh, the community board and uh, resource organizations like mine and others uh, came together over a period of time to develop a community generated plan that will be coming out shortly that hopefully will reach to represent a community consensus on how to preserve the three Chelsea developments. It's a model I believe that NYCHA should try to use in all of its planning uh, citywide, wherever that will work. Um, so uh, uh, in addition to the need for more collaborative planning and decision-making with residents as required by the way, under HUD 964 uh, regulations, um, I think there's a need, more of a need for uh, independent uh, technical assistance to residents going through the process, the rather complicated process. And I think the resident planning fund proposed by NYCHA is a step in the right direction. The other question, the other process question that arises is uh, a question of timing. Whether given the pandemic, the stresses it puts on uh, resident leaders, uh, TA presidents who are trying to protect their communities, uh, provide uh, services to vulnerable housing, households, whether this is the time, isn't the time to slow down on RAD conversions. I understand NYCHA's wish to generate the capital quickly that's needed to repair and restore our public housing. But uh, this seems to be a, a time when uh, uh, we need to uh, 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 slow down and take time to fully engage residents in the decision uh, process. Um, and uh, uh, with that, I think that uh, uh, we need to move forward, uh, as has already been said, at the pace of resident engagement and trust, uh, given the amount of distrust and anger at NYCHA among many residents, it will take time to overcome that. And I hope the process will, will do that in time as it seems to be doing in Chelsea. Thanks. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Lucy Newman, followed by Debbie Dominguez Higgins, followed by John Forster. Your time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and thank you to uh, Chair Ampi Samuel for your commitment to public housing and uh, the 600,000 NYCHA residents who call NYCHA home. I wanted to e echo um, the comments from Vic Bach from Community Service Society and H Hector Vasquez and uh, Borough President Gail Brewer, um, all of whom were um, part of, along with Mary McGee and others, part of the Fulton Elliott Chelsea Working Group. Um, I am going to be submitting written testimony later. Um, to the extent the residents do decide that they want to go forward with RAD or PACT at their developments, um, and they are, you know, fully engaged in, I think, a model just like the working group at Fulton Elliott Chelsea, I just wanted to highlight one area um, that we think needs attention 
uh, during and after a packed conversion. What we tend to see a lot on the ground is that management staff at the development um, know that they are going to be transferred to a different development after conversion. And what that tends to lead to is um, basically a lack of um, attention to residents on their behalf leading up to the conversion because they don't really have any stake in that development going forward. And so we really think that uh, there should be a packed transition team that gets placed into any development that is undergoing conversion to ensure that residents receive the service that they are entitled to and to make sure that loose ends that impact tenants' rights and protections get taken care of and tied up prior to conversion. I wanted to let um, Ms. Dominguez Wiggins, um, who is a client of ours, discuss and tell uh, the panel some of the um, experiences that she underwent in trying to take care of uh, her brother's um, tenancy requests prior to the conversion at Wise Towers. So I'm handing over to Miss Wiggins, uh, who's on the line now. Time expired. On mute. Okay. I wrote everything down so that I could. Uh, Keep to keep to what I, what was very uh, imperative to discuss with this panel. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today, residents, chairs, panel, NYCHA, PAC, legal aid, and supporting staff. Good morning. It's now afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Dominguez, and I am a social worker in the Bay Area of San Francisco. As a psychosocial family social worker and family partnership and wrap services, working with families resolving issues of mental health, housing, probation, immigration, and myriad of court proceedings, I am advocating on behalf of my brother. My brother, Michael Dominguez, is a former boxer with Parkinson's, and because of his literacy issues, it has been, an imper it has been imperative that my mother and I assist him. Myself as a former resident of the beloved Upper West Side Wise Towers. Thank you, Gail Brewer. As a former resident of the beloved Upper West Side, I decided to fly cross country to assist my brother. Michael is a Golden Glove two-time champ, a World Cup bronze medalist, Puerto Rico's national team, and selected US boxing team. <sighs> Michael is an Upper West Side fixture. As a former boxer and trainer, he continues to give to the Upper West Side as a boxing instructor. He shares his skills to children of the Upper West Side, instructing them in pro-social activities. Famous neighbors train with him and restaurateurs donate equipment for the children to keep them focused on school and out of gangs that are trying to convert these kids. But Michael converts them to health and wellness, kids for free and donation from adults. Michael has been living in the Upper West Side with his companion, partner for 10 years in a NYCHA apartment. There, they proceeded over two years ago, they were given documentation at NYCHA in 2019 and the last in May, 2020, to add him to the lease. They thought it was all going through. She fell ill and passed away in October, 2020. Today, we're coming to the panel to express our frustration, how my elderly mother, of 84 years started this process with multiple calls, conversations with NYCHA and PAC, and no one could assist her. Going back and forth in person as I crossed the country, putting my family at risk, putting myself at risk, putting my elderly parent at risk. I tried multiple calls, over 40 calls. I have a myriad of calls that I made to NYCHA. I'm a professional advocate. This is what I do for a living. NYCHA has lost forms multiple times. And I expressed to them if I could get a copy, I gave all pertinent, pertinent information to show the rights of a resident and the documentation needed to no avail. I was ping ponged back and forth from NYCHA to PACT, PRC. I'm not sure why the multiple efforts to solidify his housing has been thwarted. I'm here today to share the lack of checks and balances as it relates to the transition. 
Also, I have been recently informed by neighbors that the same NYCHA maintenance crew members have damaged boilers, heating, keys to maintenance equipment and maintenance equipment, elevators as they were on their way out. This I experienced firsthand while I was there with no heat for four days, no hot water for three days. And then it was posted and when posted beyond posted dates, no water, no heat. This all within my two week stay, multiple days in a row, weeks and no elevators for a week at a time. What happens to the elderly during this time? Was my thought. I flew across country at risk to myself, my family, issues that arose due to the transition of NYCHA PAC PRC. I had met upwards of all these calls. I called legal aid, I called PRC, I called housing, urban renewal, et cetera, et cetera. I was zigzagging, talking to them multiple times and still no answer after two weeks of my visit. Heavily guarded for COVID-19, I still broached the subject and went out into the community to help my brother. Who, it, who has Parkinson's and still making in-person appointments with no resolution is extremely disheartening. Over multiple times, I expressed that I was calling all the numbers that were given. I even spoke to PRC with Coach who said, Coach, this new company that's supposed to help the residents, a nonprofit organization who said they would advocate him after I called. They expressed to me they would not do it until he was on the lease. Wow. My experience has been unfortunately as a ping pong. PAC program said I would have to go to NYCHA to fix the issue. NYCHA has been unwilling to work with us. I have never in my experience seen the level of inactivity and disingenuous efforts on the part of other human beings. More importantly, there is a person on the other end of this inactivity that is left with housing vulnerability and the instability of having to move out with animals in tow. Michael's afraid he will be kicked out with their dogs. I must ask on behalf of my family, including my mother, who has been a longtime advocate of the Upper West Side, Mrs. Dominguez, an advocate who started years ago with Urban Renewal Inception as an advocate for voting housing rights with Strikers Bay since the 1960s. I would like the committee today to support our family in solidifying my brother, Michael Dominguez's lease at NYCHA or P PAC PRC to shore up his housing and house, his dogs after losing his companion partner of over 15 years, he needs to continue to live without the impending feeling of being removed from his home and having to start the process all over again from homelessness to housing. To housing. I would hope and pray that the needs of the residents and all of those most vulnerable in our community are seen and heard and that more importantly, their needs are being met with more transparency and accountability to protect residents in the community from the lackluster performance of NYCHA and now moving forward with PAC. There must be an understanding of the complexity of transition, yet an understanding of basic needs is knowing that housing is not basic. It's never been a basic need. It's a paramount need of all of its residents. I thank you all for your attention and I'm inspired by the residents who expressed on behalf of themselves and their neighbors and their great community. Thank you to all for listening to our very personal story as an example of how families are trying to find ways in which to assess and sure up stability and how there is no checks and balances at NYCHA and furthermore at PAC, PRC, RAD. Sincerely, on behalf of my brother, Michael Dominguez and my mother, my name is Debbie Dominguez Wiggins, not Higgins, as a tenant of human experience, one must allow for the lack of our own expertise in someone suffering to allow ourselves transparency of our own humanity to take the lead in a collaborative way. Thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me this time. I just wanna jump in here real quick. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, on behalf of your brother and your mother, this, this is why um, I think it's so important to hear the real stories so we can address them directly. And so I will be looking for um, follow up. So thank you to Lucy, um, well, Ms. Newman. <laughs> um, you know, clearly I need to, to get some background and follow up with NYCHA. So, but thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much.
We will now hear from John Forster, followed by Danny Cabrera and then Nikki Lucas. Your time starts now. Good afternoon. Um, I'm John Forster, I'm a former vice president with District Council uh, 37 uh, and currently a representative from Local 375, who we represent over 200 of the architects, engineers, and project managers that work at NYCHA. Um, I have presided, I presented a, a series of questions in regards to the blueprint for change, which I also raised at the assembly hearing a few weeks ago. And I just want to say for the record, labor is by no means unanimous in its support for blueprint for change. Um, there's a lot of questions out there, which we are still looking answers for. But in terms of the RAD program, I mean, we're using public funds here to develop and restore, private funds to develop and restore public housing. Um, that's, that's not a good thing from the start. Um, and we believe that this can and will, in fact, lead to the privatization of public housing. We're very concerned about um, what is the, the how are, are, are affordable rents, in fact, going to be maintained in these in these efforts? Are we, is the result is there going to result in more evictions? Um, is there going to be increasing pressure on tenants and families to actually relocate under this circumstance? Um, we're also concerned about what does privatization mean to our members to in, in providing the services and in providing, um, are they going to maintain and hire union members? Are they going to continue to keep uh, the civil service staff on board? I mean, what does that mean? I, I mean, for all of the supposed safeguards of RAD and PAC, it means bringing in private entities whose bottom line is the bottom line. Um, that is not uh, a, a great position for public housing. Um, we have no public records about how the success of RAD has operated so far in New York, and we certainly know that it has been challenged across the country uh, in, in Minneapolis, in San Francisco, uh, in other uh, areas across the country, and, and I think we seriously need to, to look at those. Um, so we're calling for a, a moratorium on RAD uh, until we can get credible reports on what the, the conversion, what the success or failure of the conversions have been before, until we can get a real opportunity to get feedback from the residents on this issue and from the staff that have been impacted by these conversions, and until we get a better idea of what are the possibilities under the new Biden administration. I mean, we are at a moment in time where we have an opportunity to not only repair, but expand public housing in this city and in this country. And we need to look at ways to do that. Two, two things that come to mind immediately, the Green New Deal for New York City Housing Authority is a very comprehensive approach that I really urge people to look at. And more recently, um, an equitable recovery report that has been put out by uh, the Coalition for Climate Works for All Coalition um, is also worth looking at. So I hope we're, we take these other experiences into account and that we put, we had asked for a moratorium on RAD at this time until we can have better information uh, in terms of how it's operated to date. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll now hear from Danny Cabrera, followed by Nikki Lucas and Paula Martinez. Your time starts now. Not hearing you, we're getting a lot of uh, feedback. Can you hear me better now? Great. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, so as we all know, um, well, I'll start again. My name is Danny Cabrera. I'm a policy analyst at Citizens Housing and Planning Council. Thank you all for this opportunity today. As we all know, Knights is in desperate need of more resources and greater transparency and accountability to ensure they better serve NYCHA residents. While RAD in its current form is far from perfect, we do believe RAD is a good and necessary tool as it provides the capital funding for developments, for development needs, along with additional oversight through public-private partnerships. Through our research, we've seen early examples that PAC slash RAD can be successful. In 2018, we conducted an, an uh, evaluation of Triborough pilot project, which utilized structure similar to RAD's public-private partnership for six NYCHA properties. We compared work orders for the Triborough properties with a group of properties that remained in NYCHA control. We found that after investments were made, 
new mend and new management was in place, the number of work orders dropped and the repair times um, improved substantially. We also conducted a tenant survey and we found from and we heard from hundreds of residents about their impressions of the rehabilitation. The, roads, the results were pretty, were pretty unsurprising when $80 million was spent to modernize development. When tenants get new kitchens, new bathrooms, new operating systems, residents are happier. However, we also found residents in Triborough reported feeling safer, rated day-to-day -day management, uh, management as more responsive, and experienced quicker repair times than residents in similar NYCHA properties. However, it should be noted, while Triborough and RAD have had, and early RAD projects have shown results that indicate RAD slash PAC can be successful, the program still does remain controversial. NYCHA, NYCHA has earned the mistrust of tenants. RAD slash PAC and other NYCHA 2.0 strategies can, however, change that um, and use it as an opportunity to center resident voices and, and enact resident decision-making in the process of redeveloping their homes. CHBC's research from London provides a blueprint for how we can do this in New York City. And we all know residents have the most knowledge about their housing needs and the needs of their communities. This, need, this knowledge should be looked at as a resource to the city. Time Res expired. Residents considered for RAD, BTB, our transportation preserve, should be given information about the physical fi and financial needs of the developments, why their development was selected, and play an active role in the decision-making process. We believe this is not only the right thing to do, but we have examples from the UK where this was done, where residents worked directly with the housing authority and the affordable housing sector to redevelop their homes. The same can be true here. And while the original conception for NYCHA 2.0 did not include a role for resident decision-making, we hope that NYCHA and the city have become open to the idea. At CHPC, we believe the future of RAD slash PAC, NYCHA, NYCHA residents, and the city's housing, public housing, rest on NYCHA's and the city's ability to establish a true and equal partnership with residents and establish NYCHA residents as decision makers for all preservation projects. And it should be noted, that does not mean a EULA process. A EULA process will not, will not center residents as equal partners. That, that centers community, par community folks as partners. Thank you so much. Thank you. We will now hear from Nikki Lucas, followed by Paola Martinez and then Elizabeth Gurry. Your time starts now. Chairman Amprey Samuel and uh, members of the Committee on Public Housing, good afternoon or good evening at this point. My name is Nikki Lucas once again, and I am a founding member of the Coalition to Save NYCHA. And I thank you for this opportunity to discuss and speak with you regarding programs and policies relating to NYCHA. NYCHA's needs have never been more dire. However, that need has largely been, man been manufactured through deliberate inaction. Year after year, for decades on end, I can recall NYCHA residents pleading for help with repairs, infestation, mold, lead paint, unsanitary conditions, broken doors, windows and elevators. The list is truly endless. These conditions compounding over time and multiplied into tens of thousands have left residents out in the cold. And every winter, this can be taken as a matter of fact. Time and time again, we witness this agency jumping into action when confronted by an alarming news report or a court order. For the last several years, there has been much talk and praise about NYCHA Blueprint for Change, peppered with clever acronyms and promises of a better life for the residents. However, at the same time, thousands of residents are still being ignored in attempts to gain consistent, decent living conditions. In recent testimony, NYCHA Chairman Gregory Russ admitted that NYCHA's proposals and goals to advocate, to advance, excuse me, the agency. I'm expired. The mention of the Baez Agreement, which would require apartments with mold to be addressed. However, since that ruling eight years ago, NYCHA deliberately removed apartments from being covered under that apartment 
once they have been transferred into the RAD rental assistance demonstration program, putting these tenants at the mercy of private developers. NYCHA is actively fighting in lawsuit in a lawsuit seeking to overturn this determination. The fundamental concern with these programs is that they lead to the privatization of public housing. There is no real estate portfolio more important in New York City than NYCHA, with an estimated 600,000 people living across its buildings larger than any city in New York State outside of New York City, we cannot afford to give away this vital part of our city. We are putting this very important real estate portfolio in the hands of private developers who are notorious bad actors when it comes to low-income earners. There's nothing these developers can say or any agreements that can be created that will remove the fact that they are notorious bad actors when it comes to low income earners. This will never change. RAD gives the developers the properties almost outright, while the blueprint plan does it a little more subtle through a public trust. The private real estate industry has long sought to weaken treat uh, excuse me, weaken tenant protections, deregulate rents, ignore fines, and refuse to pay their fair share in taxes. Why would this city subject some of its most vulnerable residents to private landlords? This has to stop. And the Coalition to Save NYCHA will do everything we can to stop this entire process. And if we don't do something now about this, the alarming rates, especially in East New York, of the out of control numbers of people that are in shelters and that are homeless are going to certainly increase in numbers after this privatization. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Paola Martinez, followed by Elizabeth Gori, and then Kristen Hackett. Your time starts now. Hi. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I have a written testimony um, just to make sure that I, that I keep up with the time. Um, good afternoon, Chair Alika and Pri Samuel and members of the Public Housing Committee. My name is Paola Martinez. And I work for Catholic Charities Community Services at the, as the director of the social services program at the Betances Houses, located in the Mode Heaven neighborhood in the South Bronx. As a NYCHA site participating in the PACT program in partnership with Wavecrest, MDG, and Catholic Charities. What language? Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello? Uh, yes, you may continue. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I was just saying that we have rehabilitated um, 1,088 units of housing that are home to over 3,000 low-income New Yorkers. As the social services provider on site, we liaise with community partners and city agencies to provide much needed services to our residents. In 2019, we conducted a needs assessment and learned that residents at the Betances houses desperately needed access to eviction prevention programs jobs, education, and vocational trainings, as well as primary and mental health services. With these priorities in mind, we developed our community engagement strategy, strengthened partnerships with important service providers in the area, and launched our own programs to address the needs of our residents. In 2020, recently in this, on December, we conducted a needs assessment to determine the needs of individuals with disabilities residing at the Betances houses, and we are currently working with, uh, with Wagner College to conduct an assessment to determine, the, to determine how COVID-19 has affected our residents. And let me just make sure that um, you, you can see me because I didn't turn, up, turn on my camera. I apologize. Here I am. Our tenant advocate, 
and our case manager on site advocate for individuals and families by helping them navigate city resources and apply for assistance. Hard. Especially when they are enduring hardships and that, such as the loss of employment or death of a family member. The long and tedious application process for benefits can be discouraging. So, and such was the experience of one of our residents. I would like to provide an example. Luis and his wife, prior to moving to Betances, lived in the streets and then in a shelter for over two years. With our support, we were able to secure furniture, health services, immigration legal assistance, and help them to apply for HRA benefits and provided additional support during the pandemic. Since the launch of our program in May 2018, our team has secured over $100,000 in grants to help residents cover their arrears. We have referred residents to numerous um, services such as immigration, HRA, and provided over $60,000 in direct assistance to, the, to residents who were impacted by COVID. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly presented itself as an opportunity to be more intentional and strategic about our work and how to support our residents, many of whom are essential workers. Food insecurity and lack of education, for example, are two challenges that affect our community. Therefore, to support our residents, we created an e-mentoring program, understanding that many of them would find it challenging to um, implement remote learning. We provided laptops and school supplies, as well as connected students with an e-mentor that motivated and guided the students. Thanks to our partnership with Wavecrest MDG and private donations, we were able to allow 20 students to participate in this pilot program that will continue through the end of the academic year due to its positive impact, both for the mentors and the mentees. Being a mentee allowed students to improve their communication skills, express their feelings, and find new interests, as well as engage with role models. Additionally, in partnership with the NYC Food Emergency Program, Fresh Direct, and Feeding Our Neighbors Program, we have distributed over 500,000 meals since the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020. Through partnerships with corporations, nonprofits, and city agencies, we have engaged our residents and provide assistance in a variety of topics such as financial empowerment, workforce, and training opportunities, including OSHA trainings. We, we have also employed numerous um, residents in our site. Our resource fairs are, are very well attended, I have to say, by over 300 and 400 residents each time we do one of these events. I want to share briefly some of the lessons we've learned over this, over this year and a half. We have learned that the most important thing is to listen to our residents and understand their needs to plan and engage the right partners and to deliver much needed services. Having a social services team on site has allowed us to respond faster to our residents' needs when they are faced with challenges or a, or a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic. We recommend that the city expands these programs and increases the staff to provide social services in NYCHA properties participating in the PACT program. I will be happy to answer any questions that you may have and to share my information um, if you want to learn more about what we're doing at the Betances Houses. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you to all council members and, and those who have an interest to learn more about what we do at Betances. Thank you. We'll now hear from Elizabeth Giori, followed by Kristen Hackett and Margaret Masak. Your time starts now. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Gurry. I'm a Skadden Fellow and Staff Attorney in the Citywide Tenants' Rights Coalition at Legal Services NYC. LISNI is the largest legal, civil legal services provider in the nation, has a long history of representing tenants living in NYCHA. As a Skadden Fellow, my project seeks to vindicate the rights of NYCHA tenants, including those facing privatization of their units under RAD or NYCHA's blueprint for change. As we've heard today, there's an overwhelming need for city council to take steps to ensure that public housing tenants can live with dignity in their own homes and have their rights fully protected. I'd like to thank the committee for prioritizing this critical issue. We have three main areas of concern about RAD and the blueprint for change. 
First, we fear that the leveraging of private resources for repairs may lead to violations of tenants' rights and unscrupulous landlord and management practices in the long term. Second, there is a lack of accountability and oversight mechanisms for both programs, both in program structure and implementation. And third, there's widespread tenant confusion, fear, and anxiety about these programs and their implementation. With my remaining time, I'll just briefly talk about how these three areas of concerns manifest in the RAD program. In terms of rights violations, we've seen continuing conditions issues after conversion, as landlords have failed to both make critical repairs in a timely manner and to keep tenants updated about repairs progress. We've heard some reports of harassment during construction, and it remains an open question of whether RAD conversions have led to an increase in displacement or an increase in, in eviction filings, um, which we all know is a traumatic for, for tenants. We've heard today that NYCHA does in fact track um, evictions or tenants who might face induction in legal process. Um, more research and disclosure of this information is urgently needed and, and NYCHA should disclose that information um, quickly and as soon as possible. With respect to lack of accountability and oversight, NYCHA allows conditions in buildings slated for RAD conversion to significantly deteriorate prior to conversion seemingly seeking to offload critical repair costs to the new landlord at the expense of tenants' health and safety. As we've also heard today, NYCHA management practices have led to severe confusion, loss of paperwork and applications prior to conversion, leading to holdover proceedings that we've handled after That's conversion. Funny. On top of this, once buildings have converted, there are no concrete mechanisms to hold NYCHA accountable for their oversight of the new landlord and the management company. Finally, as to tenant confusion, fear and anxiety, much of this is attributable to poor um, NYCHA outreach to tenants, as we've all heard about today, and a deep mistrust between tenants and NYCHA due to years of mismanagement, abuse, and neglect. Um, I, I urge you to read my written testimony for recommendations and for comments as well on the blueprint. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the committee. Thanks very much. We'll now hear from Kristen Hackett, followed by Margaret Masak and Rima Jason. Your time starts now. Uh, good evening, everyone. I just want to make a correction. My name is Yvette Kemp. I am co-chairperson of Justice for All Coalition located in Astoria, Queens. Christian Hackett is a colleague of Justice for All Coalition. Um, <clears throat> Justice for All represents tenant residents in Astoria, Woodside, Ravenswood, and Queensbridge houses. And our tenants are very, very upset, and they're getting mad. They're tired of paying rent and they're not getting the services that they're needed. It's bad enough that they're dealing with COVID where hundreds of tenants have died, even a tenant on my floor. Families have died in one apartment. When COVID hit, no one was told in NYCHA about the protocol of being safe, how to stay clean, how the buildings are being cleaned, the workers don't want to clean, they don't want to get sick, which we understand, but at the same time, our tenants are living in practically squalor. And because the buildings aren't secure, you have homeless staying in the buildings because when they got kicked out of transit, they had no other place to go. So now they're going to any little place that they can find, and it's not there. And on top of that, people are dealing with mental health and wellness issues, food inequality. And for those who speak up about repairs in their apartment to management that become targets of retaliation. This is ridiculous. And this blueprint should be stopped. It shouldn't even be talked about in COVID. And I think it's really disrespectful that this will be implemented during COVID. Nobody is taking people's lives in account here. People are not taking an account how are the elderly going to get their food and their medicines. They're scared to death to go outside because they're afraid they may just drop dead by one breath. Come on, somebody kind of has some accountability here, some responsibility and some kind of compassion. It's like you're making money off of misery and that is not fair. And so NYCHA need to get that act together. And also the tenant presidents need to speak with the people, not for the people because people are getting misinformation. They don't trust their tenant presidents. So everybody got to get their act together because people are losing their lives over this. And then you're going to do a bl blueprint talking about chains, chains for who? Because it seems like it's going to be a change for those that are going to make money off of this. So I really need NYCHA to take a step back and not do this at all, because this is not right. The people are not even ready. They're trying to make it to through the day, much less think about where the hell they're going to live if they get put out. 
So come on, people, let's have some compassion here. Let's do the right thing and leave the blueprint alone. Thank you for listening, Madam Chair, and for everyone here in the panel. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Kristen Hackett, followed by Margaret Masak and Rima Jason. Time starts now. Hi, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, my name is Kristen Hackett, and I'm an executive committee member of the Justice for All Coalition and a doctoral candidate at CUNY's Graduate Center, where I study housing policy and urban development. From what I've seen in both of these roles, RAD is a raw deal for tenants and one with larger societal consequences that negatively affect us all. We're being told by Greg Russ and by uh, NYCHA that RAD is pre about preserving public housing when in fact RAD conversions transfer buildings out of section nine, meaning that those buildings categorically are no longer public housing. So this is in fact moving us in a direction towards ending public housing altogether. It's really important that that's clear and not that's not contestable really. In addition to being transferred to section eight, private companies are being are brought in to manage the properties. I did a preliminary analysis of the private actors the city and NYCHA have brought in. Uh, and these are some of the worst landlords in the city. Wavecrest is notorious for tenant harassment and high rates of eviction, but number two and number three on 2019's worst evictors list are also in multiple deals. In fact, these three together now control the majority of units that have been converted so far, amounting to 10,000 households. The other deals are not different. They, are, uh, they also include similar actors with long histories of abuse of tenants and abuse of public money. When I started this analysis, I didn't think it would be good, but this is way more egregious than I thought it would be. It is hard to imagine a worse lineup. It's almost like the city went looking for the worst landlords in the city, and there's actually some evidence of that as well. But I think more so this is really about profit. Tenant harassment and abuse and eviction doesn't happen because private actors don't like tenants. For them, this isn't personal. This is about money and profit. Landlords engage in tenant harassment and eviction because that tenant is deemed to be standing between them and more money. And that is a reality driving these conversions. These RAD deals are being structured in a way that maximizes profit for private actors without real concern for what that means for tenants or society. Ron um, Wallace, head of l &M Development, number two of the uh, 2019 worst evictors list and now in control of nearly 3,000 former public housing units bragged about this on a recent panel in 2019. He said, there's money to be made in affordable housing. It's great business. The government directly and indirectly subsidizes 70% of the capital stock. And he was talking about RAD specifically. This is achieved through massive financing deals to the tune of $200 million that are tied to low income housing tax credits. First, if we don't think that these companies are over leveraging themselves by taking on this much debt, then we're kidding ourselves. Over the last 20 years, we have learned that over leveraging is a key business practice of these kinds of firms. And that's concerning because when economic downturns occur, it translates into a neglect and abandonment and deteriorating living conditions for tenants. Meanwhile, private companies walk away scotch-free. So while the immediate effects of RAD conversions are bad enough, the future looks worse with more tenants in peril and the state even less equipped to deal with the needs of tenants. It's also worth talking about these tax credits a bit more. They were developed in 1986, supposedly with the intent of subsidizing affordable housing, but there's evidence of backdoor dealings with corporate actors. And within a year, they had figured out how to exploit them for financial gain. And they have become a main source of corporate welfare, providing massive tax abatements for corporations. In part, this is because these tax credits exist alongside a loophole that was never closed that allows corporations to double dip in the tax pool. This reality, which RAD furthers, is key to the decline in corporate comp contributions to our tax base, even before Trump rewrote the tax code further in their favor. Over time, this has cost us dearly, both in terms of less public money to provide for public goods, like public housing, and the affordability of affordable housing has become shallower and shallower. It also has consequences for economic and political inequality writ large, as wealth becomes increasingly concentrated through these practices specifically. Research shows that the most cost-effective way to provide deeply affordable housing is through direct investment, not through subsidizing private profits. To say this another way, fully funding uh, public housing through Section 9 is not only the more humane approach, it is the more fiscally responsible. Also, and lastly, on the whole, what this tells us about RAD conversions is that this is not about public housing or affordable housing or tenants at all. 
It is about converting what was a non-speculative form of housing into a functional tax shelter for private actors, a vehicle through which private actors not only profit, but are also able to shield their profits from tax responsibilities that we are all subjected to as members of this society. With this in mind, I implore this committee to publicly and loudly demand a halt or a moratorium to all RAD conversions in New York City and further to demand public investment. There should always have been a political will to do this and none of the committee members before us today are new in their roles. So they, this is something that they always could have done. But with the political factions realigning right now, there is more political will to fund public housing now than in years past. Not doing so is irresponsible and willfully inhumane. I also wanna stress that advocate, advocating for public funding is the bare minimum. Really, I implore you to throw your support behind robust legislation like the Green New Deal for public housing, which is simultaneously a housing, a jobs, and a climate change bill that not only preserves public housing for existing tenants, but for generations to come, while also repositioning it as a central mechanism to addressing the national housing crisis and altering the trajectory of our society. Housing is a human right and it's time our elected officials enact, start enacting that moral imperative. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Finally, we'll hear from Margaret Masak. Your time starts now. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. And thank you for this hearing. I just would like to say I'm one of the tenants that has been participating in a lot of the blueprint meetings. And I would like to say that a lot of times when I ask questions, sometimes um, I will be told they're gonna get back to me. So they brush me off and then I don't get back to. Uh, there's no email follow-up of the questions that I ask. And I don't understand why they're always talking about debt so early on the game, because I feel that the debt that they will put us in, if we're not able to pay it somehow in NYCHA, this is just selling, um, just really giving away NYCHA to the private developers. I believe that we as advocates and staff of NYCHA need to fight federal um, government to fully fund public housing like it used to be before however way they have to do it. Instead of all the disinvestment, give us the money that we're supposed to have to run this public housing and to maintain it for the next hundreds a year or whatever, because housing is a human right. And we need to always work together to maintain housing instead of making all these schemes to give away housing to the private developers and for NYCHA staff to wash their hands and the politicians to wash their hands of NYCHA because affordable housing is much needed and um, public housing is affordable housing and we really need it and we need to continue to fight. And we need to fight for the transparency that's not really there, even though they seem like they try sometime, but it's not really there. And I am a retiree and I feel that I've been fighting so much just to keep uh, afloat and I'm really tired of fighting and I wanna rest and I want them to do what they have to do their jobs and I don't wanna have to tell people what to how to do their jobs. I feel offended by it. Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes our time of public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on anyone to testify, please raise your hand now using the raise hand function on Zoom and we will try to hear from you now. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Ambry Samuel to close the hearing. Well, thank you so much everyone for today's hearing and you know, coming out, uh, taking up so much of your time to stay here during the entire duration of this one, what is it, 539 now? So four and a half hours of, of the hearing. Um, and I really do appreciate each and every word that was spoken today. Um, I just wanna say again that the theme today was partnerships. And when we talk, of, I know every time we say privatization and private, it makes NYCHA um, cringe. And so, um, and so understanding that this is a public-private partnership, but it cannot be a public-private partnership without really considering 
the residents as true partners. And another thing that we've heard throughout the entire four and a half hours was the fact that so many people chimed in to say that the process should be slowed down, there should be a pause. And um, we even heard that from Victor Bach, uh, you know, that that slow down conversation, let's, you know, look at what's happening and, um, and, and really just slow down during this, this time frame. And so I just wanted to put that out there. And I also want to apologize to Ms. Margaret because um, I know you're a NYCHA resident and I did not realize that you were on the list. And so you would not have all, um, you know, testified last. That was not my intention. So I do apologize to you for that. Um, with that being said, I, again, I thank you. And I look forward to the ongoing discussion, um, especially when we start talking about what's coming out of the federal government with the new administration and the infrastructure bill. So be safe, everyone, um, and enjoy the rest of your evening and week. And we will get through this as a community. Thank you.